welcome to Ariel Helwani's M.M.A. Show! Back in your life on this Monday, March 2nd, 2020. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani. Welcome back to the program. I can't believe it's March. How crazy is this? Two months into the year? This is insane. Where's the time going? Well, I'll say this. It's been a great year so far. 2020 has been fun. We had another fun event this past weekend and this coming weekend in Las Vegas. Ooh, we UFC 248. Two title fights on the card. The return of Israel Adesanya. Yes, it's not Adesanya. Listen, let's establish this right here and now. The next six days or so, I'm going to be saying Israel's name a lot, all right? And it's not Adesanya, it's Adesanya. It's actually Adesonya, if we're being like real sticklers. Adesonya, all right? He meets Yoel Romero. Huge fight, 18 and 0. Last style bender, soldier of God, silver medalist, 2000 Olympics. Yoel Romero going for another title. Probably his last chance if he wins. Second oldest champion in UFC history. Going up against the rising star. Fastest guy in the modern era to win seven fights in the UFC. I mean, look at this. And then, of course, Zhang Wei Li has been through so much over the past month. Going from Thailand to Abu Dhabi. Getting quarantined. Coming over to Las Vegas. Defending her title for the first time against the former strawweight queen, Yoani Jacek. It's amazing stuff. Yoana could be the first female in UFC history to win the same title on two separate occasions. It's never been done, so I can't wait. But before we get to all that, I got a lot of thoughts on this past weekend and some other stuff as well. We've got a great show planned for all of you. We're going to be talking to some big names, including Israel Adesanya and Yo Romero and Paul Felder. I'll give you the lineup in a second. But first, some thoughts on this past weekend. And you know what I have to start with. I have to start with the main event this past weekend in Norfolk, Virginia. UFC flyweight title fight. We talked all week long if this was the beginning of a new era for the flyweights, if this was an opportunity for either Joseph Benavidez or Davidson Figueredo to assert themselves as the new face of the flyweight weight class. It seemed pretty clear that Henry Cejudo did not want to cut to 125 anymore. And especially at the beginning of the week, we found out that Cejudo was going to defend his bantamweight title in May against Jose Aldo. And we could talk on and on about that. And I feel like I've made my thoughts pretty clear on that fight and how crazy of a fight it is last week. And so I won't get too much into the weeds on that particular one. But it did seem like the dawn of a new era. Well, guess what happens on Friday? By now, you probably know Davison Figueredo missed weight Friday morning. Weighs in at 127 and a half pounds. Benavidez makes weight. So now we got a problem, right? This is just the... Third, fourth time, I should say, that it w there were three times prior to that, just the fourth time in UFC history that a title contender misses weight. First time, Joe Riggs, Matt Hughes. Second time, Travis Luter against Anderson Silva. Third time, Yo Romero against Robert Whitaker. That graphic's a little bit wrong. It should be Robert Whitaker. But you get the point. Romero missed it prior to an interim title fight. In any event, we had a problem here because we've got a situation where the UFC is trying to crown a new champion. Well, in order to win the belt, you have to make weight. So what happened was sort of shades like Toronto a couple years ago where we had Anthony Pettis and Max Holloway fighting for the interim belt. Remember, Anthony Pettis missed weight, so the belt was only on the line for Max Holloway. It was the same thing going into Saturday. And you got the feeling, as wacky as this division has been over the past eight years, remember how it all started with the miscalculation between Ian McCall and DJ in Australia. I just had a feeling on Friday, like, of course, this is going to happen. Of course, Figueiredo is going to win this fight and the belt will be vacant. And now the division is really going to be in shambles. It seemed like everyone was rooting for Benavidez because if he won, he'd be the champion and he would breed new life into the division. But it just seemed like as weird as this division has been since its inception, something wacky is going to happen. And guess what? Something wacky did happen because Davidson Figueiredo won the fight on Saturday. Not only did he win, he annihilated Joseph Benavidez. I mean, that was, in my opinion, quite one-sided. And I just got the sense, much like the Whitaker-Izzy fight back in October, Benavidez, to me, seemed tentative. He seemed nervous. He seemed like he was putting too much pressure on his shoulders. He was saying all week long how he wasn't doing that. And when he got into the cage, it seemed like he was too caught up in the moment. 
And in the fight itself, look, I'm not going to be the kind of guy to like break down film. I'm not going to be that guy. I'll never be that guy. But I know fights when I watch them. I know what's going on. I've watched enough of them at this point. I don't know what Benavides was doing. He was swinging for the fences left and right. He was throwing haymakers. It seemed like he wanted to end this fight early. It seemed like he wanted to knock out Davison. But he wasn't setting anything up. Everything was telegraphed. Everything was these big, loopy punches. It was very wild. It was very unimpressive. And I tweeted, going into the second round, I thought Figueroa won the first round, and I said, Benavidez better be careful because he's going to get caught. Figueroa is really good. I know he's not a household name, but he is really good, and he hits really hard. He's going to catch Benavidez. Moments later, they clash heads, and let's make something very clear here. The clashing of the heads was not Figueroa's fault. Yes, they clashed heads, opened up a big gash, but they clashed heads because Benavides was leading with his head and then moved it up. If he doesn't do that, which he was doing in the first round, they're not clashing heads. That was not Figueredo's fault. So anyone who's blaming Figueredo for this, look, he deserves enough blame for missing weight. He screwed himself in that situation, but not in the clashing of the heads department. And that was the beginning of the end. And then he gets knocked out. And it was kind of shades of the Demetrius Johnson fight. And you feel for Benavidez. He is a veteran. He is a great fighter. This now, his third crack at a UFC belt in, uh, in the last, what, eight or so years. He had a crack in WEC. So technically 0-3 in the UFC, 0-4 under the Zufa umbrella. Uh, no one has ever gone 0-3 in official title fights. I know some of you like to bring up the Uriah faber Barrow interim title fight. I'm not going to count that one. So no one has ever gone more than 0-3. No one has done worse than 0-3, I should say. Um, and a bunch of people like Gustafson and 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 uh, and Dan Henderson, others have gone, Chael Sonnen have gone 0-3, and now Benavidez finds himself in that category, and you have to wonder if he ever gets another title shot. And so we have a situation where Figueredo wins, and the title is vacant. And so I see a lot of people saying, like, let's be done with it. This is the perfect out. It's over. I say no. I say you have something special in Figueredo. Look, the UFC can't afford to get rid of divisions. They can't afford to get rid of titles. Not right now. Not when they're putting on 42, 43 events a year. Not when they're creating interim titles. Not when they're trying to find suitable main events for all these shows week after week after week. You can't do that. You've got an official belt. Don't get rid of it now. The same reason you shouldn't get rid of the women's featherweight division. The 145 pound weight class for the women. I wouldn't get rid of that either. Davison Figueredo versus Joseph Benavidez, non-title fight, is kind of a hard sell, let's be honest, as a main event, right? Davison Figueredo versus Joseph Benavidez for the flyweight title is an easy sell. you got the poster, you got the belt, you've got stakes. Oh, it's a title fight on ESPN+. Plus. Now you can sell something. So you need those titles. I wouldn't get rid of it. Now, it's a bit clunky. It's unfortunate. There's no champion. But what you have to do is find a new contender for 125 and match him up against Davidson Figueroa. you got to give him another crack. I know you don't want to reward someone. Let's be honest. The man has suffered enough. Didn't get a performance bonus. I saw an MMA junkie that his Reebok thing went down from 30000 to 5000 which to me is just absolutely ludicrous. I mean, what? If he had a sponsor, they wouldn't dock his pay because he missed weight. Unless they're a really mean sponsor. He deserves his 30000 for being in the main event. But again... No one's collectively bargaining that, and no one has a seat at the table, and you know how I feel about all of that. In the end, the guy lost a lot. Not only did he lose a chance at becoming a champion, he lost a lot of money as well. I think he's suffered enough. So book him. If you want to do it against Benavides again, sure. I don't see a lot of interest in that fight. What I would do is Figueiredo against Henry Cejudo in Brazil. Tell Jose Aldo, can you win one fight? Can you win one fight at 135? With all due respect, you're a legend. You're a first ballot Hall of Famer. I don't want to disrespect you. But can you win one fight at 135? Let's do Cejudo Figueiredo at 125 in Brazil, May 9th, UFC 250, and do Amanda Nunes against Felicia Spencer in the co-main event. Who says no? Who says no? Don't get rid of the weight class. I know most of you want to see it go. I still think it's fun. I still think there's great talent. And I still think there's an opportunity to build stars like Davison Figueredo. The guy's a great fighter. I know he doesn't, you know, speak English and he doesn't like sell himself and he doesn't do wacky things. But how do you not watch that fight and say, I want more of that guy? He screwed up royally. But I'd like to see him fight for the belt next. And I want to see him fight Henry Sudo. And I know there's zero chance of this happening, but this is my pipe dream. So let's call an audible. Crazier things have happened. Call the audible. Do Cejudo versus Figueiredo for the 125 title. 
And then, like I said, do Nunez versus Felicia Spencer. And what I loved so much about this card was you had two weight classes who are, you know, usually overlooked, the bastard childs of the UFC weight divisions, getting the limelight on Saturday. It was fun. And I wish they would do this more often. I really like this. You've got a little mini tournament going on on the card. You had Megan Anderson and Felicia Spencer fighting on the same card. And it starts with Megan getting the early knockout. Ooh, that's great. Well done. That was amazing. She set the tone. She sent the message. You know that Felicia Spencer is in the back watching this, right? She's got to do something impressive. Now, it seemed to have been somewhat forgotten that Felicia Spencer has a win over Megan Anderson, right? Has a win over Megan Anderson back in May of last year in Ottawa. We forgot that for a second. But anyway, it was fun. Sets the tone. Sends a message. Great knockout. Boom. Two wins in a row. Megan Anderson says, give me the belt. Ooh, this is fun. Amanda Nunes is tweeting about it. I mean, who didn't have a blast watching this on Saturday? And then we get to Felicia Spencer, and she gets a first-round TKO. And to me, that makes it pretty elementary. It has to go to Spencer. Not only did she go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Chris Cyborg, not only did she win on Saturday, she has a win over Megan Anderson. And I get the impression Felicia Spencer is not afraid of Amanda Nunes. Now, I'm not suggesting that Megan Anderson is afraid of Amanda Nunes, but... Megan Anderson is slowly but surely coming into her, her own as a fighter. She has talked openly on this show, sitting right over there, about nerves, anxiety, about doubting herself, about not wanting to come out of the locker room, right? It seems like she is getting over that. I think you would be doing a massive disservice to her if you put her in there against Amanda Nunes right now. Let her get one or two more wins. Let Nunes fight Spencer. If... All goes well for Nunes in that fight. Let her go down to 135, perhaps fight at a, an Irene Aldana, and then let Megan Anderson, after a couple more wins, if all goes well, fight for the belt. But I think Felicia Spencer is a lot more ready right now to fight Amanda Nunes, to fight for the belt. After what she did against Cyborg, the heart, after what she did on Saturday, I think she's better on the ground. In a perfect world, they both get a few more fights to get ready for Nunez. But I'm told that Nunez wants to fight on that card on May 9th. I'm told she really wants to fight at 145. She wants to defend the title. She wants to be the first woman to defend two belts in two different weight classes. You got this fun little mini tournament on Saturday. So you got to do it. That's the fight. Spencer Nunez. If Megan Anderson would have won on Saturday and Spencer lost, all right, then if she really wants to do it, then you put her in there. But I think this was the best case scenario for Megan Anderson. Great. You look great. You now won two in a row. You're coming into your own. Let Spencer fight Nunez, see how that plays out, get another victory or two preferably, and then you fight for the belt. So we'll see if they make that fight. Nunez seems adamant to uh, fight at 145 next, and they could probably use another championship fight on that card, May 9th in Brazil. One other thing about the card on Saturday, how wacky was the Ion Kutalaba Magomed Ankalaev fight? That was incredible from the moment it started. First of all, Kutalaba was the star of the week. The suits that he was wearing, I got to find his tailor. He looked phenomenal. But then the fight starts. Actually, I should say, they're both in the cage. Fight doesn't even start. And they go toe-to-toe. -to -toe, and I've never seen this before. They actually get into like a mini fracas. They actually like touch each other. And there's underhooks involved. And there's touching involved. And there's chest-to-chest -chest involved. I mean, that was just wacky stuff. The, 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 the security, the commission, they took way too long to get involved. Way too long to break them up. But... All right, fine. They break them up. And then, unfortunately, the fight lasts like less than 40 seconds. And it was just a horrible call by the referee, Kevin McDonald. He jumped in way too, way too soon. Now, I don't buy the theory that Kutilaba was doing rope-a-dope. I really don't. I saw his interview afterwards with Brett Okamoto, and he was like, that was part of the game plan. Part of the game plan was to pretend like you were rocked on your feet in the first 36 seconds. I just don't buy that. But I also will say... It was an atrocious call. He was not fully out. He was still swinging. He was still punching. Yes, he was a little rocked. Yes, he was a little banged up. But that was way too premature. And it was funny. In the next fight, you had Felicia Spencer just raining down blows. And it seemed like that fight should have ended 25 seconds sooner. Take the two fights and you kind of find the, the median and then you can get a perfect call. But in that particular fight, that was a bad call. And uh, I think the thing that you have to do, I mean, you got all this buildup with the the face-to-face -face thing that happened before, and then the controversy, just run it back ASAP. Sucks for Kutilaba. He doesn't get half of his pay. You know, you suffer greatly as a result of, 
a mistake by the referee. And these are these situations where I wish you can hear from the referee, get his point of view as to why he stopped it. And perhaps if you really were doing the old rope a pretending to be out, maybe this will deter others from doing that. But I just don't think people do that in, in MMA as much. There's too much at stake. You get hit with those four ounce gloves. You don't have time to do that, especially not 35 seconds into the fight. 15 minutes into the fight, 14 minutes, 13 minutes, fine. But 30 seconds in, I don't believe that you're doing that. Bottom line is, horrible call. So, I just talked about May 9th, right? We spoke about this very briefly last week on the show because it, it, it came out in the middle of the show. We're starting to get a sense for the spring schedule. We're starting to get a sense that the UFC wants to do this. May 9th, they want to do Cejudo versus Aldo. I say call the audible, but they're not going to listen to me. We all know that. We know that they're going to probably put Amanda Nunes on that card, probably against Felicia Spencer. We also know that in early June, June 6th to be exact, they're going to Perth. We found out last week it is going to be Perth. We know about Valentina Shevchenko going up against Joanne Calderwood for the 125-pound title. We also know that Volkanovski is going to be on that fight card, and we know that Korean Zombie had eye surgery, and so it's looking like it's going to be Holloway part deux. Holloway's not really campaigning. Again, leads me to believe he knows something that we don't. So those are two title fights. And then we start to get to July. And so I say right here and now, the UFC has to do this sooner rather than later. You need to book July 11th, Conor McGregor versus Justin Gaethje. I told you last week on the show and everyone went crazy that, you know, Gaethje is the front runner. Preliminary talks. Nothing more has happened since then, so you can all just calm down. But here's the thing. you got to book Conor McGregor on that card. I know that Dana White has come out and said that Usman versus Masvidal is what they were targeting. Well, guess what? When he said that, there were no real talks of this fight happening just yet. So what you do is this. You put Conor on the card because you're not going to create a new card for Conor. They've already established this. This is not happening. I think this is a mistake. Conor wanted to fight in April, May, June, and they're saying, no, we're not creating a new card. We're the boss here. You're not going to trump the brand. All right, fine. The ne if you just read the tea leaves, and this is the thing that I was saying time and again, everyone was going all crazy when they came out and said, when Dana came out and said, if he beats Cerrone, he's going to fight for the belt. Everyone lost their mind. Remember when everyone lost their mind when he said this? And I said to you, what? Calm down. Just look at the schedule. Habib is fighting Ferguson in April, and then he's not going to fight until the fall. Connor has said time and again that he wants to be active, dating back to that press conference in Russia. Remember that press conference where he said he wants to fight three times? He's not going to wait. And I see this interview with TMZ where Dana says, it's looking like he doesn't want to wait. Yes, it's looking like he doesn't want to wait because he said that back in November that he doesn't want to wait. He's not going to wait. He wanted to fight. He was talking about March originally and then April. And then May. Well, they don't have the opportunity because they're not going to have him fight in Brazil and they're not going to have him fight in Perth. The next opportunity to fight on pay-per-view is July 11th. So what you have to do is, unfortunately, Usman Masvidal, you guys got to wait. Either fight early August or late August. They've got two shows there. All right? You guys wait till then. And we've got Stipe in D.C. Potentially, we're going to find out later on this week about Stipe's eye. He's got a doctor's appointment. And, of course, we've got John Jones. And it looks like Dana's warming up to the rematch against Dominic Reyes, which is muy bueno. But you got to do July 11th. No titles because you're not going to put another champion on a Conor card because of the pay-per-view points. You're not going to split that pie because he earned so much money. You do Conor McGregor versus Justin Gaethje. That's the fight everyone wants to see. That's the fight that has the most momentum. No one else has really raised their hand. No one else has campaigned. Justin is the guy. You do that fight at 155, preferably to get ready for Khabib. Of course, we hope that Khabib Ferguson happens. And then seven days later, in Las Vegas, you got Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder 3. Our colleague, Dan Rayfield, has already reported that that fight is in the works for July 18th at MGM Grand. Could you imagine what the scene would be like July 11th in Las Vegas, Connor versus Gaethje, and then seven days later at MGM, Wilder Fury 3. Could you imagine the travelers? Could you imagine the people coming over from overseas? Could you imagine the money generated for Sin City? Perfect. I just booked it for you. Done deal. Make it happen. Again, if you read the tea leaves, if you look at the schedule, there's no other spot for him to fight. And I see people saying, well, Dana said Usman versus Masvidal. No, he said that's what they were targeting. He never said it was a done deal. And it's not a done deal. That fight card is open right now. You got to give Connor what he wants. He calls the shots. He's the biggest draw in the game. You put him July 11th to set the tone. And then you say, all right, top rank. All right, PBC. You try to one up us seven days later. How incredible is that? Tell me you're not buying that. And then you do Usman Masvidal later in the, uh, the summertime. And then you do Jones and you do hopefully Stipe versus DC3. All right? You're welcome. Let's do it. All right. Here's today's lineup. 320, we're going to be joined by the reigning defending UFC middleweight champion Israel Adesanya. 
the last style bender himself in Las Vegas, getting ready for Yoel Romero. I can't wait. Always great to talk to Izzy. At 3.20, we'll talk to Luis Pena, who had uh, an eventful week in Norfolk, met his biological father, met his biological brother for the first time. He's like a walking ancestry DNA ad. This man is amazing. Found his uh, mother a couple months ago, thanks to our good friends over at Ancestry. So we'll talk to Luis Pena, who had a big win over Steve Garcia. New camp for him, ATT. Looking forward to that conversation. We'll talk to Duran Wynn at 245. He's fighting on this week's UFC 248 card. He faces Gerald Mearshart. Remember, he lost his first pro fight in his last fight back in October in Boston against Darren Stewart. And he also missed weight prior to that. And that's a big no-no when you're a wrestler, when you're part of... Team DC, a.k.a. It's uh, kind of frowned upon to uh, to miss weight. So I'm looking forward to seeing how he bounces back, and I'm looking forward to seeing how he responds on Saturday. At 2.25, we'll talk to Paul Felder. Haven't heard much from him since his loss to Dan Hooker. Again, you'll recall he hinted at retirement. We'll see where he's at nine or so days later. Demetrius Johnson will join us at 2.10. Want to get his thoughts on what happened with the flyweights and what happened with Figueredo and Benavidez. And also he has a fight coming up in April against Adriano Moraes. Megan Anderson, who we spoke about earlier, will join us at 155. Talk to her about her big victory. Yoel Romero will join us from Los Angeles. He's doing some media day stuff over there at 135 to talk about the title fight this weekend. But first, let us talk to the pride of Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Yes, she reps... Orlando these days, but we know when it's when it's time to fight, she's got the Canadian flag behind her. She is a Canadian at heart. She is, in my opinion, the number one contender at 145 pounds. She is the phenom Felicia Spencer. Felicia, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing really well. And wow, what a static shot that is. No movement. It's just there. I love it. It's locked in. <laughs> yeah. Well done to you, and well done on the victory on Saturday. Congratulations. And so I, I want to start with this, because we were just talking about this before you came on. I thought it was really cool the way the UFC booked this. They had you and Megan fighting on the same card. They had her fighting first. I think you get the nod. You're higher ranked. You beat her. She sets the tone, and then you respond. Did you watch her fight? Were you in the locker room watching what she did? And when you saw what she did, did you say to yourself, all right, I need to do something better than that. I need to one-up her. I, I didn't actually watch, but I my team, you know, kind of was reacting to it. I was kind of just in the zone, um, and I, I didn't put too much on. You know, I figured that it would be, you know, that it was possible that she would also get a first round finish. But I knew I wanted to do also a first round. You know, just do my job. I'm just focused on me and making my statement. So I didn't put too much weight on it. So the TV is not even on in the locker room. The TV, yeah, the TV was on. Uh, I'm not too big on like watching, but it's not like I try to avoid watching. I just, I'm just thinking about what I'm gonna make, and you know, it's there in the background. Did you run into her at any point throughout the week? Uh, not much. Um, during the ceremonial weigh-in, I, you know, was close to her, and you know, we had some words. You know, all good. We're good. So uh, I ran into my opponent more often than I ran into her, and also. I ran into Paula at the time. So it seems like everyone was, was very chill, very cool. What was that like when you ran into Zara? Um, very cordial. I mean, she came, shook my hand. I think I was sitting down and she walked out, shook my hand, and, you know, basically just smiles and good luck. You know, best, uh, best to you and see you Saturday. So it was, to me, it was, you know, nothing crazy, just meeting someone and... <laughs> Gonna see you later. Yeah. Uh, other than uh, the tough finale, uh, the season of the Ultimate Fighter, which featured the the women's featherweight division, this was just the second time in UFC history that there were two women's featherweight fights on the same card. Did you view this, as they said on, on the broadcast, like a mini Grand Prix? Did you view it this way? Like, oh, the fact that they're putting us on the same card. All right, they're trying to see who comes out looking better and that a potential title shot is on the line here? That's the way it seemed. I mean, that's, you know, everyone's been talking about it and Absolutely, you know, but it was a showcase for whoever's going to fight Amanda. Um, and, you know, I know that that's what Amanda wants to do is have a fight really soon to defend her belt. So, you know, I think uh, I think I did enough to earn it. And earn I think, that shot. 
And I think Amanda deserves a lot of credit, right? Because she doesn't have to be so adamant about defending that title. But I think her doing so opens the door for one of you. She could say, look, I'm going to fight at 135 until a suitable contender emerges. But she has told the UFC quite clearly, from what I'm told, I want to fight at 145 next. Are you aware of this as well? And, and did you know this before the fight, which gave you some confidence that, hey, if I do something great in this fight, I could be next? Absolutely. I mean, Amanda's been saying that for a while, that she wants to have that that check you know, on her list of achievements to be the first to defend both of her belts. And I know that that's what she's been wanting to do since her last fight. So um, to me, it was just a matter of showing up, doing my job impressively, which I think I did. And, you know, taking uh, taking my shot at the title next and, and you know, winning the belt. And so how about you going into this fight? Because, of course, the last time we saw you was in July. What a big opportunity that was. What a great showing from you it was. But it was your first pro loss against Chris Cyborg, of course, in, in Edmonton. Going into this fight, how did you feel about yourself internally? Because you were coming off a loss. At the end of the day, you could be showered with as much praise as possible from Dana White and media. But you did come off a loss. Did you feel like you were less confident, doubting yourself, anxious? How were you reacting to coming off your first pro loss? You know, it... I felt I felt really good. I felt kind of just back in the swing of things. You know, every fight, I, every fight is the biggest fight of your life. Whatever, whatever, whoever's next in front of you is gonna, you know, make your career go this way or that way. So for me, Cesaro was my next biggest step, and you know, it, it's always just big. So uh, of course, you get, you know, I, there's always the roller coaster of nerves. But to me, it's like I'm ready. I expect the nerves to come. So when they come, I'm, I'm comfortable with them. Um, and there wasn't really any, you know, not too much added pressure. I know that, you know, from the outside, it seemed like there was a lot of pressure to, you know, to be impressive and, to, you know, to win, of course, with the circumstances of, you know, fighting Zara who fought me again. But to me, it was just, I need to go do my job. I need to uh, make a statement. And I wanted to be, I really wanted to make it as violent as possible. So, uh, you know, to show a little bit of a different side that people haven't seen as much of. And, uh, you know, it, it pretty much played out the way, the way I was what, if anything, did you learn about yourself and about fighting um, when you went in there against Chris Cyborg, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with her for 15 minutes? What did you come away with? Um, you know, for me, it was uh, just, it gave me that little drive again of, you know, not that I ever lost drive, but that little push to just see every moment that I, you know, that's in the fight. Um, I know there was a lot of things that could execute differently with Chris, and, uh, you know, I still believe I can win, and it's just a matter of, you know, training to, you know, to react certain ways and to also just take what I see and, you know, um, just execute, execute things differently, you know, and everyone is beatable and everyone, you know, can find a way to beat anybody. So, um, so I'm excited to have another big opportunity to take on another legend. Like, I feel like the luckiest person to see, like, I get in, I have a win, I fight a legend, I get another win, I'm going to hopefully get to fight another legend all within a, you know, within a year. So um, I'm, I'm, I know I've earned my spot, and I'm, I feel really grateful to be in the position I'm in, too. Any particular reason why you took seven months off in between fights? Um, well, the, I wanted to try to fight at the beginning of 2020, uh, you know, with fighting Megan, and then right away jump me back into camp to fight Cyborg. I knew I'd want a little break. Um, I wasn't sure, you know, how long that would end up being. But I was thinking, like, January 1st, so it worked out all right. Um, I did also get married uh, to my longtime fiance um, in December, and so that was, you know, we kind of threw that together quickly. Since I was like, well, I still don't have a fight lined up, and he didn't have a fight lined up, so like, let's hurry and just get married and engage forever. And uh, so that that you know, it worked out really nice to be able to do that, and and then jump back into camp. And he actually jumped right back into fight camp also. So it was a it was a it was a busy couple months. And congratulations, Mazel Tov, on the on the marriage. And I understand your your husband now. Uh, he has made his pro debut as well, right? Exactly. Yep. He got a faster TKO finish than I did, though. So wow, it's always a competition. Yes, I love it. That's amazing. Do you feel different now that you're a married woman? Like when you're fighting, do you feel like you have a different purpose or kind of the same thing? Uh, no, it's kind of the same. Um, you know, nothing really about our life has changed. It's just, uh, you know, now we're officially married. <laughs> We've pretty much been living the married life for a long time. Uh, we did get a puppy, which is the only thing that's really drastically different about our life. Um, but as far as the motivation, you know, I'm, I'm there 
you know, I, I, I fight for those around me, you know, my team, I feel like I can um, showcase my team and everyone that's ever put anything into me. It's all, you know, on display when I fight, but I also fight for me and uh, I like to play. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I'm there and I'm, I'm going to go all the way. And by the way, what do you think of the finish? It seemed like it was just going on and on, and especially considering the last fight ended so prematurely. Were you thinking in the midst of that, like, all right, do I still have to keep punching her? She seems to want nothing to do with this. Um, there was a point where it seemed like it could have been done, but, you know, when I'm in there, I didn't really think about it at all. It's just a matter of, you know, I just, you just have to keep going. You know, ground and pound can be exhausting, you know, if you train it, you know, it's, I was like, just don't stop because if you take a break, then she'll have a moment to, you know, bridge or she's, you know, she's got really good uh, bridging, you know, when she, when she gets that leverage, she can do a lot. So I just wanted to be relentless and for me, it was just go, 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 you know, be a buzzsaw until, until the ref steps in and it, you know, it was a long time, but she was doing just enough some time. Um, someone brought it to my attention after the fact that it might've been a little bit late, but you know, it wasn't like I was, you know, making her bleed all over the place. It wasn't like too crazy. And I know the whole crowd was probably a little, you know, a little iffy with the last stop. I didn't, I didn't get to see that yet either, but, um, you know, it is what it is. The, uh, the rest do a great job for the most part. And, um, I thought it was good. You were okay with the stoppage, but perhaps not okay with the, uh, the decision to not give you a bonus based on that Instagram post. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like I'm, I understand, you know, I understand. They have a tough choice to make, but yeah, I definitely like to tease about that. Like I was uh, really gunning for a bonus tonight or, you know, on Saturday. Uh, it slipped by me when I beat Megan and it slipped by me and Megan got the bonus this time. So I was like, dang, you know, uh, I thought I did something, you know, a little bit unusual. Hopefully it was exciting. I thought it was kind of exciting when to finish it, but, you know, she did a good job too. So, and then there was another really great finish and uh, what can I do? Hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll attack one next time. So to be very clear, you want to fight Amanda Nunes next. You don't mind if it's May 9th in Brazil, but you think you've done enough to warrant a title shot. Is that accurate? Yeah. You know, I guess I wasn't very clear after, after yeah. the fight. I, I, I didn't think that it was going to be such a big debate, to be honest. It kind of surprised me after the fact that everyone was heavily debating, like every post was who should get it. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that I beat Megan less than a year ago and I mean, I know she's coming off of a win, but I also just beat the person to be. And, you know, I'm a fan of Megan. I think that she'll get a title shot. Maybe, you know, give her a title shot next. Uh, when I'm the champion, I'll give her a read at that point. You know, like, I think I earned it, and um, it's my turn, and I'm ready for May. In a perfect world, would you like to get one or two more fights? I know that, you know, you're, I'm not saying that you, you don't want the title shot, but you are relatively young as far as your MMA career is concerned. Nunes has been doing this a heck of a lot longer. Do you feel like a couple more fights would help you or do you, do you really think that you are ready for Amanda right now? I'm ready. You know, I mean, a year is, um, if I wait a year, is it going to be that much different? You know, I just came off of another great fight camp. Uh, I feel better than ever. And, you know, I, like I said, I have a little bit of experience with someone who's very experienced, but I also, you know, some, some of the girls I've fought in the past have been, fighting the best of the best for a long time. Um, you know, like Pam was one that spot everybody and I've, you know, hung in there with, with a lot of the best. And, um, I think, I think it's ready. I think, I think it's time for me to just jump in and like I said, there's not much going on in the division otherwise. So I, I think it's, I think it's time. When you, that spot. when you, when you watch Amanda fight, what, what holes do you see in her game? She's looked so good as of late. How do you, how do you beat her? I mean, you know, it's, there's always, there's always little things that you see, you know, and I can't really say off the top of my head right now, but you know, when I get my hands on people, things have a you know tendency to go a certain way. Um, I know my striking looks a little unorthodox sometimes. I like people think like that a lot, but I don't care. Uh, it works for me. So <laughs> um, I think, you know, we saw some, some interesting things in her last performance with Jermaine and, you know, every fight's going to be different. So I don't really put too much weight into a performance of the past, you know, I know that everyone's evolving. Um, every, you know, every, I'm a different type of fighter than most people that she faces. So, you know, a lot of things can go differently. And uh, I think there's some clever things I can do to take her out, you know. Um, so I'm excited to test my skills against her. I'm, I'm, it, it really, it really excites me to have the opportunity. 
Are you saying that maybe you weren't all that impressed with her last performance against Jermaine? Oh, no, I was, I mean, it's a, it was a good performance. You know, there was just, we were starting to see an Amanda that was like just taking people out, you know, in the first round a lot and just kind of like crazy finishes. Uh, so it was just a good, it was a good reminder I think, that she, she's a human being, you know, just like, just like Chris, you know, she's just a human being and she has a game plan. And sometimes things go really, really well when you have a game plan and, and you take people out in the first round. And sometimes you just have to grind through it, you know, and same goes for her, same goes for me. Sometimes things work out. She doesn't have a, you know, she doesn't have a perfect record. She's not unbeatable. Uh, I know she's done a lot of diff different things in the last part of her career, but there's there's definitely a lot of things I see that I can capitalize on. And I know nothing, no fight's going to be the same. So I'm, I'm ready for her. Good luck to you. Good luck to you, Felicia. I hope you get this title fight. I hope that you get this opportunity. I've been so impressed with what you've done. Shout out to New York Rick way back in the day who was telling me that there was a young woman from Montreal who uh, was fighting in Invicta, right? Who was making waves, who would be one of the top contenders at 145. And uh, I hope you get it because I think you did enough on Saturday. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on getting married. Congratulations on the win. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in May against Amanda Nunes. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, guys. All right, there she is, the phenom, Felicia Spencer. As you can see, 8-1 and one as a pro, 2-1 in the UFC. Her fourth career first-round finish. Got the first-round finish on Saturday. Entered as the biggest favorite on the card, a minus 850. Wow, according to Caesar Sportsbook. And outlanded Farron, 40-13 to 13 in significant strikes, 30 to nothing on the ground. I thought the fight went a little too long especially following the Kutilaba fight, but um, perhaps you can say that Farron was defending herself. I thought she seemed to not want to continue to fight and was just kind of turning her back and saying, please, like there's always that weird point there where you don't want to actually tap due to strikes because there's this negative stigma attached to that, but she just kept going and then eventually Dan Margulata stopped the fight. So on Saturday, we had, uh, we had Megan Anderson fight first and then we had... Felicia Spencer fight in the co-main event. This time we're switching it around. Spencer will come on the show first. And then later in the show, we'll get Megan Anderson to state her case. In a matter of seconds, we'll be joined by Mr. Yoel Romero. But before we get to Mr. Yoel Romero, let me tell you about Blue Chew. Guys, everyone has performance issues at some point. Want to avoid it? Get to bluechew.com. BlueChew.com has the first ever chewable that brings your performance to another level. Check this out. They've got the same active ingredients that are in Viagra and Cialis, so you know they work. Since they're chewable, they can work faster. You can take them anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach. And this stuff is cheaper than those other two, so this is a no-brainer. Plus, you don't need to go to the doctor's office or spend time waiting in the pharmacy line. Blue Chew's online physician consult is free, and once approved, your order ships straight to your door in discreet packaging. Here's a great deal for you guys. Visit BlueChew.com and get your first order free when you use promo code ARIEL. Just pay $5 shipping. Again, that's BlueChew.com, promo code Ariel. And also, let me tell you about my good friends over at ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging. An overwhelming amount of resumes, too many applicants, but not enough of the right ones. Trouble spotting the most qualified candidates in a sea of possibilities? Well, you got one place to go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash MMA. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job sites, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invite them to apply to your job. You can even add screening questions to your job listing so you can filter candidates and focus on the best ones. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. And right now, to try ZipRecruiter for free, my listeners can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MMA. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MMA. Again, ZipRecruiter.com slash MMA. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. All right. Thank you very much to them 
for supporting us, and I would say support them because they support us. All right, in a matter of seconds, we're going to be joined by Yoel Romero. He's in Los Angeles right now, about to go on a very busy media tour. Uh, being the rinky-dink show that we are, we have to catch him before the media tour because you know we can't get on the schedule, but that's okay because I'm looking forward to talking to Mr. Romero because he's got a big fight coming up on Saturday. We all know that he's had the opportunity to fight for three titles in his UFC career, unfortunately, due to some unfortunate circumstances. He hasn't actually fought for an official one yet, but here he is at age 42, 42 years young, getting an opportunity to fight Israel Desanya. And Izzy deserves a lot of credit. Once it became known that Paulo Costa was not going to fight on March 7th, Izzy said, I want that guy. I want the soldier of God. I want the most feared man in the division. And I think the promos that they put out uh, leading up to this fight have been phenomenal, just kind of telling the story of how feared Romero is and how dangerous he is. At 42, this man was a silver medalist at the 2000 Olympic Games. 2000 Olympic Games. It's 2020. I think I think Izzy was 12 years old when the 2000 Olympic Games were going on. And here he is, still doing his thing. I mean, it's amazing. Again, at 42, he could very well become the champion on Saturday. And if he becomes the champion at 42, he would be the second oldest fighter in UFC history to win a UFC title. Of course, way back when, UFC 68, it was Randy Couture defeating Tim Sylvia to become the heavyweight champion. And we all remember how great of a scene that was in Columbus, Ohio. And here's Romero doing his thing against Israel Adesanya on Saturday in the main event at 42. It's unbelievable. So without further ado, let us say hello to the man they call the soldier of God, the one and only Joel Romero of Cuba. Right shalom, Joel. Shalom, shalom. How are you, my friend? Everything good. Everything good, Javier. How are you? It's good to talk to you. Are you ready for history on Saturday? This is an opportunity to win the belt finally for you. What is the, what, what are the emotions? Yeah, what are the thoughts right now in your mind on Monday? Um, I'm very excited, you know. I'm, be, I'm feeling be, very blessed. Um, you know, one more time. Uh, one more time. I'm, uh, I, uh, I'm thinking about uh, go back for, for Miami with, with the belt. Um, I want to make it happen the, the the community for the for the for Miami and the Hispanic community. Uh, I want to make it very happy for my country. That's what I, only what I think of right now. I'm very excited, you know. I feel great, man. I feel great. It's great. Yeah. I see that smile. You're representing the Miami Marlins. It's a great scene. Uh, I have to ask you this because everyone's kind of concerned. And, and, yes. And, and new. Look at that. That is nice. Who made that for you, Yoel? Who made this for you? Who gave you this present? Was it Abe? Was it Abe that did it? Oh, that's the um, the good friend for me for the, the for Miami. Okay. Is um is it is it every time what they give me the 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 hat I win every oh. time when they give me the hat I win. Well, perhaps that's a good sign. Now, you're going into an elevator right now, so it looks like we might lose you here. Yeah. He, 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 he. Yes. This is great. <laughs> Walking into the elevator. Okay, let's wait for him to come down from the elevator, and uh, he'll walk out of the elevator, and then we'll continue the conversation. I like the Miami Marlins hat, by the way. It's a nice hat. I like that logo very much. Um, but again, I wanted to ask him. I was just about to ask him about his weight, because I remember he was in studio MMA hour days prior to the Whitaker fight, and he seemed to be in great spirits, but they made him go to New York. Remember that? They made him go to New York, and then Chicago. He went from Florida to New York. Where am I looking here? Florida, New York, and then he went to Chicago, if my geography is correct, and then we all know what happened, but the Illinois Commission got a little jumpy there, and they told him to you know, not cut weight um, anymore. They said he didn't have time. I don't know, a bit of a weird situation, but here he is going from Miami down here to LA, he's currently in LA, and then Vegas, bit of a shorter jaunt, if you will, but it's still some activity on the Monday before the fight. And so I think there's some concern uh, about the schedule. And so we wanna know if he's gonna be healthy, if he's gonna be prepared to make weight. He's gonna be going from there to uh, Las Vegas, I believe later on this evening or early tomorrow. So it's not the craziest thing. Uh, a little surprising, Izzy only came to uh, to Vegas a couple of days ago with the time difference and whatnot. All right, I think we have Romero back, is he there? Yoel, you there? Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. How much do we weigh on the Monday before the fight? 
What, what, what are you saying? Say it again, say it again, Ariel. How, how much do we weigh? Quanto tu, tu, tu libra ora? Ora? 189. 189? 90, no, not 98. 98. 98. Oh, 198. 98. Okay, so 98. we got, uh, what, uh, 13 pounds. Is that common for you? Is that is that the right amount compared to the past? Say it again, Ariel. Is that, is that a common weight for him on the Monday before fight? Is it regular for the lunes? He says that's very good. It's very good. Normally, Way ahead of schedule. Normalmente siempre peso dos dos. Normally he's around 202. Oh, wow. 192, 202, depending. Yeah, depending. Yeah. Any any differences from this particular um, you know, training camp and, and especially on fight week for the weight cut? From from a year and a half ago in Chicago, like, are you going to have anyone with you to make sure that there's no issues on the scale? Look, of course, total different now. You know what I do? Training. I have a time for training. That's what the 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 the, the difference. Okay. I have a time for training for training camp. That's it. That's it. They say that it's no excuse. You know, you I I I I'm trying. The last, the, the, the two times where I miss way, I try to do it. But I know, I know I can do the way, my way. I know, you know. But it's no problem for me when I have a time for training, for training. No, I know, I know thinking about the, 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 the way, for my way, for the, for the fight. Okay. I'm thinking about the, the, the time for training camp. This is the most important because you you need to lose your way and training camp, you know? Yep, yep. All right, well, that's good news. By the way, I wanted to ask you, I've been meaning to ask you this for a while. Did you ever see any of that money from the lawsuit when they awarded you like $27 million, the whole thing with the, the supplement? Did you ever see any any pennies for that? Like, the, you know, that was such a big deal when you won Not that yet. lawsuit. Not yet? Not yet. Not yet. Are you expecting to see anything? Yes. Good one, Abe. I hear you over there. Come yeah. on. When are we going to get paid yeah, yeah. here? It's been over yeah. a year. What's taking it's so slimy, long? Slimy company. Slimy it, companies. Is a, yeah, is a, my 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 lawyers get going, get working. You okay. know. Well, I want um, you to get paid. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yoel, what did you think when, when Izzy was the one who said, I want to fight this guy? Like, in a, in a way, you have to give him some credit, right? He could have picked anyone. And so he picked you, despite the fact that, you know, technically the judges awarded the last fight for Paulo Costa. Do you, do, you, do you thank him? Do you have respect for Izzy for picking you? And why do you think he picked you? Um, You know, I, uh, well, every time it's depend the, 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 depend with the, it depends on how they say it. Everything... Uh, it's depends on what the people say. It, it, it's depends on the, on the fans. On the fans and, and, no, no, and no, the no, 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 <laughs> He say, how, 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 he asked me, mm -hmm. how I feeling when the IEC call me fight? Mm -hmm. All right. I say, depend, everything is depend. How how easy say I want oh, to fight? Oh, it's drug. the tone, right? It's the tone. Yeah. Basically, uh -huh. how how he came about saying he wanted to fight. So it's the tone. You know, it's the manner of how he of how he did it. Did yeah, you like you it? Know? Yeah, I like it because um, I feel it, I am the the really uh, um, the really man in the in the division. You know, that's it. Like uh, oh, I am the man. You know, when he say I want to fight you all, he's not. I'm not thinking about like. Uh, I'm not feeling like, a, oh man, this man want to fight me. Did he want to fight me because he want to kill me? No, no, I know, I know, I don't think like this. I see the the good feeling, like he want to fight me because I am the man. <laughs> okay. Now, what about the dance off? Who do you think won the dance off? That was amazing what you did. You did a backflip <laughs> and then split. What did you think of the dance off? Who wins? Ten nine for who? <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm not thinking about uh, who win, who lose. I do. I I I I, I do good. I I. I yo lo hice bien. Yeah, he did good. I did good. Yeah. I, I don't know the way they say. I, I did good. I I see the video the fight for Isa. He's no he no like it. <laughs> he say like he see me like it. Look at this old oh, man. Why you doing something like that? I am the, the easy. 
I am the, the dancing guy. Why are the old man dancing like this? You know, like a... You know? <laughs> now, did you hurt yourself? Because like. you were wearing jeans. Right. Did you at the, Like, after you did that, did you say, ah, this maybe was a mistake? The moves that you made, like, afterwards you're like, ah, oh, no, maybe it's a un, un mistake. Okay, it's done, you know. Everybody know, everybody see the face the way. <laughs> everybody see the face the easy, you know. And then when I do the flat. And the, they wrote that you do. Did you think you made a mistake? Like, in other words, did you hurt yourself? Do you think they don't feel the, No! Okay. <laughs> no, I know, I, 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 I know, no. I, 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 I am the freaky man. You know, I am, I am freaking man, bro. I know. I am freaking man. But um, uh, to you, it's nothing. That's it. Oh, look at it. You're incredible. <laughs> <laughs> look at the face for Dana. Look at the face for Dana White. Too. I know. He's mortified. <laughs> what did you say to you him? Know, uh, what did you say to Izzy when you guys were squaring off there? You you blew a kiss towards him. What did you say? Uh, Izzy, they say, uh, man, you know, you know, no dance. That side is a dance. You know, you know, can dance salsa, salsa dance. You, this is only for for Latino. You know, you know, you don't know, you don't know, you know, you, you don't have, you don't know that you don't have an idea for the for the salsa dance. You don't know, you don't know. That's and, right. Um, he he try dance dancing. I I do like a hip hop dancer. I can, I can hip hop dancing. I can salsa dancing. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, it it is what it is. <laughs> By the way, did you see this past weekend? Michael Bisping finally said that he loves you too. Did you see this clip? Today, Michael Bisping, he said he loves you too. Oh, I know, I know. See, I know. See, let me. You have something? Uh, I don't have see. it. I don't have it ready. But he said it on the broadcast. I'll send it to Abe to show it to you. But also, uh, it, 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 so you got Michael Bisping saying that he loves you. Everyone seems to love you, and uh, it seems like you're starting to get this respect. Here you are at 42. What would it mean for you at 42 years old to finally get that belt, to be the second oldest champion in UFC history? What would that mean to you? Um, you know, is um, I feel, uh, I feel that's what I say every time I say. Um, uh, uh, I feel I feel blessed. I say thank you, God, for bless bless my life. You know, that that is only what I need to say. Thank you, God. Amen. It's an amazing time. It's an amazing time. You know, I can I can I can do what, what, what I what I what I what I what I what I'm trying. What I what I love. You know, that's what I love. It's my passion. You know. That's it. Uh, uh, for all time, uh, uh, for a long time, uh, that's what I do, you know. In uh, um, the same passion, every day is the same passion. Have you seen uh, Darren Till talk about you all the time? He keeps saying he wants to fight everyone at 185 except for you. That he's almost like has one, nothing to do with you. He's afraid of you. Do you see these comments from Darren Till, and what do you think of them? I see, I see, I see the comment. It's so funny. It's so funny, you know. <laughs> it's so funny because I think it's um, see he see 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 lie see see la vida life. See the life he uh, put it put it here in my way. 100% that he fight. Just, I, I know he's, he says something like this. It's only funny, you know, because that, okay, it's his it's it's his job. It's his work. It's his job. You know? That's his job. Mm. Uh, by the way, can I ask you about your dog, Yoel? I've seen photos of your dog. Is your dog really 180 pounds? Looks like the biggest dog ever. What are you feeding the this big, dog? He's a big boy. He's a good boy, but he's a big boy. Yeah. He eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> eat a lot. Eat everything. It's crazy, boy. He's good. He's so funny. He's a good boy. He loved the kid, but he's, he's the big boy. He's a big, big boy. What's his name? No um, I have a many. I have a many, many, many doggies. Oh. Uh, the, um, I have a, I have a, I have a Luna. I have a, um, uh, 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 Odin, I have a Odin, I have a Titos. Wow, that's a lot of dogs. Yeah, yeah. Any chance? Uh, I know you're you're friends now with Pitbull, Yoel. Any chance that Pitbull's gonna sing 
uh, your your walkout. Here you here you are with the great pitbull of Miami. Any chance you're going to get him on Saturday to to sing out you wait, sing wait. you out to the, the the to the cage? That that what uh, everything in my life I say is a step by step. The, the, the first step is the beat of the bell, the bell, and and then when I stay and when I stay in the pay per view, where I can bring him. Oh, that would be fun. Now I remember you telling me two years ago that you want to win the belt and bring it to Cuba. Is that still the plan to bring the belt home to Cuba once once you win it? And still, still, and still. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you, do, Absolutely. Do you think that this is your last chance? Do you feel like it's your no. last shot at the belt? No, I'm not thinking about the challenge. I, I, I think that's uh, the chance for the belt. Okay. I think that's the, 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 the chance for the God, God give me. God see what I do and God say, okay, go. You know? When you think about the fight, how I, do you foresee beating him? Do you see a way, a path to victory? I knock him out. I knock him out. Because, because um, he, 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 uh, me, my, my team and me see uh, a little me. He do a little mistake, and that's oh. the key for the fight. Oh. And now, um, and now we walking, we walk with our, our hammers. We're working. We're working a lot about this. I, I, I feel comfortable. I uh, siento comfort. Comfortable. Um. I feel great. I feel great. Um, I remember, and and then the second, and the, and the second point, in the, the 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 I remember the last the last fight. The the judge say he I am no no win the fight because I no finish no finish it. Yeah. Say so, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. What's the All mistake? Right. <laughs> What's the mistake that you see when you see him fight? Oh, come, oh, come on, on Abe. Brother. Why you say no comment? Come That's on. no fun. Come he on, said bro. it. You see come something. On. Come on. There's, you know, that is a spy. Oh, okay, okay. It's a, it's That's a spy. A spy. He's calling you a spy. You know? All right. Spy. You see, I know easy. Or somebody for very good for easy see right now this uh, interview. <laughs> All right, fine. We'll wait till Saturday. Joel, thank you so much, my friend. Shalom to you. Good luck. I'll see you in Las Vegas. You're the man. All right, there he is, Joel Romero. Good timing right over there. There's the lineup, UFC 248, Saturday night, Las Vegas. I've been focusing on the top two fights, but you see some of the other ones over there. Pretty cool that Li Jingliang is fighting on the card as well. So you've got two Chinese fighters on the main card. Alex Oliveira returning. Uh, we've got the return of Mark Madsen and Deron Wynn on the prelims. I'm looking forward to that as well. For now, though, let us go back to Norfolk. And also, I should let you know that on Friday, it's the return of Invicta. And our next guest will be providing color commentary for that event over on UFC Fight Pass. She's one of the top contenders in the women's featherweight division. She is the one and only Megan Anderson, the pride of Australia, joining us coming off her big win on Saturday. Megan, how are you? Congratulations. Thank you. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. By the way, why were you walk, rocking a uh, Jurassic Park t-shirt on Saturday? Because uh, <laughs> I like Jurassic Park. It's one of my favorite movies. So I thought I'd kind of rock it. I'm rocking like a a, a Lion King one right now. <laughs> so oh. well, I thought I'd throw it back. Uh, we here at Disney appreciate the uh, the shout out to a uh, a Disney film. Thank you. I, I like the fact that they let you wear that because before they were so like strict about what you wore, and it seems like they've eased up the reins a little bit. So I thought there was something more to it, but it, it just appears to be that you're a fan of the film. Yes. <laughs> well, I think like go, like when you walk to the venue and stuff like that, they kind of give you some free reign, but uh, it once you have like the fight like on the the broadcasting side for the most part and you're fighting it has to be rework so okay um well congratulations on a great performance and with you you've been so great and so open about your journey and about you know coming into your own dealing with your emotions anxiety you were so great and i'm so appreciative of the fact that you were so open when you were on the show a couple months ago so and so i have to ask what was it like this time were you dealing with that sort of thing or are you starting to get more comfortable um 
Yeah, I'm definitely getting more comfortable. Uh, I don't think like it ever goes away, but you, you learn to manage it. And, and I think, you know, I have a really great team around me and James, my coach, uh, he's, he does a really good job of communicating and, and you know, ex- helping me accept those nerves and, and, and for me to be able to put on a great performance. Like one of the requirements is like I need to fill some form of nerves and uh, to be able to get in the zone. And, and it's a good thing. And if I didn't have nerves, we would we should be a little worried. <laughs> And, and so do you think the fact that you looked so good in your last fight, do you feel like that gave you a little more confidence? And as opposed to coming off a loss, you're starting to doubt yourself, you're putting pressure on yourself here, you're, you're on a roll, right? So you don't have to put as much pressure on your shoulders, right? Um, I'm always going to put pressure on my shoulders just because I'm so hard on myself and I expect so much more from myself for my own kind of goals and, and that kind of stuff. But really it's it's, you know, my mindset has changed and I've gotten a rid I've, I've changed a lot of things and I, and I've removed a lot of toxic and negative people and energy around me. So I'm just in like a really good place and I'm working through my shit every day and I'm just trying to be a better person and be a better martial artist. And I'm glad that it's finally coming out in my fighting. Did you view this? I, I asked uh, Felicia this question earlier. Did you view this as a mini tournament? And the fact that you were first, did you say to yourself, all right, I have to do something spectacular to set the tone here and almost put pressure on her? Um, not really. I didn't I didn't see it like that at all because like for me, like all of that talk about title fights, that's that's gonna be there this week. Uh so like it's it's not gonna go away. So there's no point in worrying about something that I can't control. Uh, so my main priority and my main focus was Saturday night. Uh, Norma, you know, is a, is a great competitor and she brings skills to the table that you can't overlook. And I never want to be the type of fighter that I am overlooking somebody cause I want like a title shot or I want to fight this person. Like I, I felt like she deserved my respect in making sure that I was prepared for her and I was focused solely on her and I wasn't overlooking her because anything can happen in this game. You know, one punch can change the course of a fight. So I said this earlier, I, I'll be upfront with you. And I, I, I said that I feel like this was the best case scenario for you, that the night played out perfectly for you because you had a great win, great performance, great finish. You're on a streak now, but Spencer wins as well. She gets the title shot because, of course, she does have a win over you um, less than a year ago. This gives you an opportunity to grow a little more, perhaps fight back um, in Australia in June, buys you some time go on a real nice streak, build up that confidence, and then you're ready for Amanda Nunes. So Spencer winning is, in a weird way, kind of a silver lining. It it buys you time to when you're truly ready for Amanda Nunes. Am I crazy? Are you upset at me for saying this? Um, I really don't care. I feel like everyone has their own opinion about it. Um, If they want me to fight her next, it's if, if they want me to fight Amanda next, like I'm going to be 100% ready, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they gave it to Felicia. Like I do understand she has a win over me and, you know, I feel like my performance on Saturday, I was in a lot of similar positions on the cage as I did with Felicia. And, um, a year ago, you know, that would have been a takedown, but I've changed so much, not just with my technique, like I'm constantly getting better as a fighter, but, those skills were always there. I just had to get my mind right. Um, and I feel like we're doing that. And, you know, I, I have a feeling that they're going to give it to Felicia. Uh, I don't know. They, they seem to, to like her and, and they'd like to give her those type of opportunities. And, and if that's the case, I feel like she's an incredible athlete and she's a top competitor and, and I wish her all the best. But uh, it's going to happen when it's going to happen. So there's no point in, in me worrying about it. I'm not going to lose any sleep over if they don't give me a title shot. I know it's going to know it's going to come when it's supposed to happen. And I want to keep if they don't give me the shot, I want to keep consistently fighting uh, and racking up those wins and showcasing why I should be fighting for the title. So when you saw Felicia win in the first round, there wasn't a part of you that was like, ah, oh, darn it. This kind of hurts my chances a little bit. No, not really. Like I would never like, you know, I would never wish somebody else like to lose um, because, you know, that's her career. And and I wish her like I wish everybody a successful career unless you're fighting me and then I want to win. But then I also wish you a successful career. Right. Um, So I think, you know, 
her winning was great for her career. And, and I think, I just find it funny that people are kind of saying that, oh, uh, I fought, you know, the lesser competition, but l let's let's be real here. I, I feel like I've had one of the hardest strings in the U uh, hardest set of competition in the UFC. And I would also say that, uh, you know, Felicia is coming off a win over somebody that I also beat faster, I think, as well. So I feel like I, I have a, a good case, but if they wanted to give it to Felicia, like all to her, I, I hope she's, you know, successful and I'll be watching that fight if that's, if that's the direction they want to go. I think the, the best part about all this, here's a weight class that for some time we didn't know if it would have a future. I think you were frustrated as well. There was no direction. They weren't booking fights and all this stuff. Now all of a sudden we have a champion who is active, who can stick around at 135 and just kind of you know put that belt off to the side and allow it to collect dust and is telling the UFC, no, I want to defend this title as well. And we have two contenders. When's the last time we had two contenders at 145? Two young fighters who have looked good as of late, rising up like... I feel like this idea that 145 should be shut down is no longer a thing. So that has to be the best part about all this, right? Yeah, I feel like it's taken a while to, to get to this point. Um, a lot of frustration, definitely. But I really hope that this is a great step forward for the division. And um, I feel like Felicia and I put on great performances. And I feel like we showcased that, you know, there are great people and great athletes in this division that they can kind of get behind and build. And I really hope that they kind of sign some more people now. Yeah. Uh, how, how would you, I know you kind of moonlight as a, uh, as an analyst here for, for ESPN over on the Australia, New Zealand side of things. So could I ask you how you would rate your chances or her chances, I should say, Felicia's chances against Amanda Nunes, if they do in fact fight in May, do you think she has a shot? Um, uh, that's the beauty of MMA. I think anyone has a chance. But uh, watching her fight against Zara, uh, she was struggling with that range. Um, and I think Amanda's str striking is much better than Zara's. And I, and I feel like she might have some issues trying to close that range. Amanda is very physically strong too, and she's very well-rounded. So I, I feel like it's going to be a tougher fight for Felicia than the, than the cyborg fight, in my opinion. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Um, you mentioned, you know, like getting mentally ready and doing things differently and, and weeding out the bad people and just trying to be in a good headspace going into fights. Are you doing anything differently like weeks before or when you get to Norfolk, for example, is, is the fight week process a little different for you so that hopefully on Saturday it doesn't feel overwhelming? Yeah, we just try to have fun with it. Um, and I think for me, like I get it. I over process things and I overthink things and I get in my head so much about uh, my expectations and how I want the fight to go and, and all this kind of stuff that I, we just kind of make it fun. We just keep it pretty low key, keep it chill. And I think that has kind of worked really well for us. And, you know, we switch on when we need to. It's rare for uh, an athlete in their prime, such as yourself to open up about their, their mental health struggles as much as you did on the show a couple of months ago. And I'm wondering what kind of feedback you got from that. And if that has changed um, in terms of you wanting to talk about it more, to be more of an advocate or anything like that, did you get any kind of feedback? Yeah, I got a tremendous amount of supportive feedback and it was truly, <laughs> it was truly heartwarming. And um, I cannot thank everyone enough for that. And it definitely is scary opening up because there was a lot of stuff that I kind of talked about that I'd never, never mentioned before. Um, so it, it was definitely a little scary, but I think there is like a strength in vulnerability and, and I just hope that if I can help one person, then that's, you know, my job is done. Amen. Um, so if it doesn't happen for you on May 9th, would you like to fight on that Perth card? Is that the, the other goal? Yeah, I would like to fight on Perth, uh, on Perth, on the Perth card, um, if possible. But I would love for the UFC to come back to Kansas City and be able to fight in front of my adopted home city now. Mm. Um, 
I think we we have like a great fan base here. We have some of the best fans in the world. Uh, the Midwest always loves to fight. They always turn up. I'm I'm pretty sure we broke some records at the Sprint Center when they they came here last, and and it was about time they came back to Kansas City. So I'd love to fight on the Kansas City card or the Perth card, just depending if they come back here or not. Uh, and, and until then, you've got the uh, Invicta card this Friday, right? Doing some uh, some analyst work. Yes. This is your first time, correct? Yes, I'm uh, making my color commentating debut, and I am so excited about this. Not just because I'm, you know, being able to put on my color commentating hat, but I'm also being able to witness the first MMA event to have the open scoring. Oh yes, which I think is. And very interesting. Yes, that's going to be fascinating, right? After every round, it's going to be? So I don't think they will do it for the tournament style because it is just a one-round fight. Yep. But they have a couple uh, – they have a they have a, a, a three-round fight somewhere in the middle just so they can give the tournament style like a bit of a break between fights. And then uh, the, the final for the tournament will be a three-round so you will know going into each round. And then the main event is a title fight for the Bantamweight champion. Right. We're, we're crowning a new Bantamweight champion for the Invicta FC division. And, you know, that's a five-round fight. And particularly with a lot of the, the recent, you know, championship fights with Invicta, they've been very close and there's been a lot of controversy going into those, you know, final rounds and the decision. And, and I think this is... This is a perfect opportunity to showcase, you know, how it is important. Like for me as an athlete, I would want to know. Like yeah. if I'm in a tight fight and it is super close and we're going to those championship rounds, I would want to know where I'm kind of at because if I think I am winning, but then we look at the scorecards and they're not and I'm not winning, okay, we need to change something up to get the job done. Yes. Oh, I can't wait for that. That's going to be fascinating to watch from home as well. So it's going to be you and the great Jimmy Smith doing play-by-play. -play. Yes. And uh, to add a, another wrinkle to that, one of the more outspoken fighters about this open scoring uh, you know, discussion as of late has been Max Holloway. And I understand Max is going to go to the event as, as well to see it in person. So I think that's really cool yeah. on his part. I just found about that yesterday, uh, which I think is incredible. I think you know, the more top level athletes that campaign for this, uh, the better, because when you think about it, like there is no one governing body that rules MMA here in the States. Uh, so then that's why there's such a big discrepancy between judging, between scoring, between, you know, what is a, what is considered a downed opponent, what is considered a not downed opponent. Um, and I think because of that, the rules aren't going to change. So I feel like this is a good step forward in the right direction to at least for the athletes to take back some control. Megan, congratulations on the win. Uh, great stuff and good luck on Friday. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. All right. There she is, Megan Anderson, one of the top contenders at 145, Pride of Australia. Big win for her on Saturday against Norma Dumont. First round knockout, got a performance bonus as well. She's on a winning streak now, and you can hear her in action on Friday for the Invicta FC Phoenix Series. Is it Phoenix Rising or Phoenix Series? Whatever. It's fun. One night tournament, open scoring. How about that? That's going to be a lot of fun. In fact, she mentioned uh, the UFC in Kansas City. How about this little segue? The last time the UFC was in Kansas City... Our next guest was the headliner against Wilson Hayes. Yes, that man. Hoo -hoo. Look Our at that old belt. friend, DJ Demetrius Johnson. Where are you at, DJ? Look at this guy. I'm right here at the gym. Did you hear that? She's talking about Kansas City, and you were the last guy in Kansas City. How much fun is that? Uh, uh, it was a great time in Kansas City. I had amazing food, um, great <laughs> barbecue. It was fantastic, and we, uh, we won that fight in Kansas City. So yes. I'm sure it's going to be a great time in Kansas City. Uh, you you won that fight. You had the the barbecue, but you made weight, right? You made weight before the fight. I've always made weight. I, there hasn't been a time in my career, even in my wrestling days back in middle school, when I was weighing ninety nine pounds, uh, I never missed weight. So I said this on uh, Saturday. I mean, it was a crazy time in the division. I said, anytime something happens in the UFC flyweight division or with the UFC flyweight division pertaining to the UFC flyweight division, I think of you. You are the cloud that will forever <laughs> hang over that division, whether you like it or not. And, and I feel like there's a part of you that wish 
that wishes like you that we would leave you alone and stop asking you about this division. But I, you know, I can't help it. I'm sorry, I can't help it. And so I'm dying to hear your thoughts. First, let me ask you about the weight missing debacle. When you heard about Davison Figueredo missing weight, what did you think? <sighs> it's a shit show. I, I remember <laughs> when I, me and Joseph, when me and Joseph fought in 2012 in Toronto, we saw Co play. It was a fantastic uh, concert. Um, but I remember me cutting to 125. I had to cut eight and a half pounds. And I said, you know, I remember waking up. I was like, fuck, eight and a half pounds. I was like, all right, let's get in that tub. Cause you know what? I ain't giving 20%. I was like, money is money. And I'm not giving, I'm not about giving free money away. So, you know, and I, and the second time I fought Joseph in California, I remember I had to cut, I think it was eight pounds and I jumped in that tub and I sat there and I made that weight. So when it comes to weight cutting, man, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the sport. It's, it's a bad thing about the sport, I guess you can say. But I, I've never missed it. You know, it, it's my job. And one of my uh, old friends said, all you got to do, you have two jobs as an athlete. And that's make weight and fight. That's it. So for me, that's always been my, you know, back of my head. But now I ain't got to worry about making weight. Because now I just walk around at 138 pounds and then just die a little bit and boom, step on the scale and I'm good. Yes, life is good for you over at one. And we'll get to your your next big fight at one. But you made a, like you made a face when I said that you're, you're, you're the cloud that hangs over this division. Do you disagree with me? Am I crazy or do you agree? I don't think I'm a cloud. I think me being the first inaugural flyweight champion and the, the, the division has been around since 2012. So I was a champion for six years and then you had Henry Cejudo and then they're still not, you know, a champion, even though uh, uh, Figueredo, I um, apologize if I um, no, you nailed his name, even though he beat uh, Justin Benavidez, you know, technically he's not the champion. So when the division had been around for almost a decade now, there's not, I don't know, a decade, but almost a decade, there's only been two champions in it. When you look at all the other divisions, there's been, you know, that belt gets flipped around like that all this, every single time. So for me to be from 2012 to 2018, the you know, Nahiru Cejudo, Nahiru Cejudo kind of vacated it, but he's still, you know, he's still Triple C or whatnot. And now there's not really a definitive champion. So I think that's why people probably think there's, you see me as a cloud over the division where I'm just like, I was the very first one to be the champion and I held it for six years and you defended it the most out of anybody in the sport of mixed martial arts. So that's why you're thinking that. How, how do you feel about the way Henry has conducted himself since winning that belt? <laughs> I think it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're okay I mean, with it. Look, look, yeah, of course I'm okay. I mean, he can do whatever he wants. I mean, he's got to do what he he's doing. He feels is going to bring his stock and his value and his buzz up. So I think as long as he's not out there, you know, commit crimes and you know hurting people, hey, do whatever you want to do, man. So when there's a UFC flyweight title fight, do you because I know you're not one of those guys that sits around and watches every single weekend. You got a life, you got kids, you got all kinds of stuff. You got video games to play. God knows what you're doing over there. But do you say to yourself, all right, UFC flyweight fight, I got to watch. This is my division. I made this division. I was the face of this division, winning as champion. Do I go out of my way to watch this? Do you start thinking of that when you hear that there's a flyweight title fight coming up? If, if it's a, a fan, I'm a huge fan of Justin Benavides. We, we shared... Uh, the cage multiple times. Like I said, we saw uh, concerts together. We worked. We went to Australia together. So I'm a fan of Joseph Benavides. And you know, when he was fighting, I think for him, I grew up watching Joseph. So when he fought, I was like, you know, I want to see him compete. I'm a big fan of him, and and so that's why I watched it. But other than that, you know, I'm not always out there like, oh, it's a flyweight belt. He's he flyweight champions fighting. I got I got to watch because I was the first one. If I'm a fan of the athlete, I'm definitely going to watch. Okay, so. What were you thinking when you saw him get knocked out? I said, damn. I felt I felt bad just because, you know, going into that fight with uh, Figueroa, I knew that he was a tank. I knew he had a hard, uh, a hard chant. And Joseph did a good job of clipping him. But when you have a guy who can just take a shot after shot and he would trade with you, he'll, he'll take a shot to be able to give his shot and you're not able to withstand his shot. Then it, it's a it's a fight, but when Joseph took that last shot, oof! I mean, you can see the energy just go through his from his chin to his shoulders, his back, and him just fall flat. And I'm like, damn, that was a hard ass shot. You know, when I was watching, and, and like I said at the top of the show, I, I'm no expert. I'm not a fighter, and I don't like to pretend to be one. I don't like to get into the X's and O's. But just as I was watching it, it seemed like he was just kind of swinging for the fences at times, closing his eyes, trying to go for the big knockout punch. As you said, Figueredo punches really hard. It seemed like he was opening himself up to something disastrous happening, and it did happen in the second round. And even with the 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 headbutt, 
I actually think that was Joseph's fault. I think he was leading with his head the whole time, and he's the one that initiated that. Am I wrong here? No, you're not wrong at all. I think Joseph, if you go back from his fight, his fighting style, he loves to throw his open hand right like this. He doesn't throw straight a straight cross uh, down the pipe. So Joseph likes to throw those those wild looping, looping hooks. Uh, that's something he hasn't been able to change. It's just his show that again. Style. Sorry, we didn't have you on camera there. Can you show what you were saying? Uh, so there? typically, Joseph throws like this. His hooks are like that. If you're going to throw over and right, you got to, you know, drop your head into it and cover your left hand and then follow up with the left hook and then go for a shot or clinch or whatever. So Joseph was just throwing the punches and not following through. If he would have went, you know, one overhand right shot and then Figueroa was doing a good job of uh, defending the shot instead of backing up from the shot, come up from the shot and then go into the clinch game, start working your clinch game, then fight from there. So Joseph was only fighting one part of mixed martial arts, which was just a stand-up battle. He did try some shots, but it's just like wrestling. If you're in, you know, a state championship level wrestling match and you do a double leg and a guy stuffs your shot, you have to do a double leg. And then when he stuffs it, you got to go for a high crotch or a duck under. You got to, he's got to be able to chain his stuff together. And that's one thing Joseph wasn't doing very well in that fight. Figueroa was doing a good job of just walking Joseph down, taking the shot. And at the very end of it, you can see him just measure, 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 then bam, right hand. So that's one thing that Figueroa did well. Um, when you fight a guy like that, you know, when I fought Ali Bogatinov, I remember kneeing him in the liver and the sternum and even the jaw. And I felt his jaw just shift. And there's a point in my mind, I was like, okay, he's not going out. Like he, this guy is, I, I don't know what it is, but I'm not, I'm, I got to pace myself and make sure I can still beat him up for five rounds. Um, and with a guy like Figueroa, you got to be very technical and you got to be able to fight him everywhere and not just stay in the room where he can just measure you. So that's like my analysis of that fight. Wow, that is great stuff. Now, the, the end actually reminded me a little bit of your knockout of Joseph back in 2013. Did you see any similarities there, even like with the hammer fist at the end? Even like where it was as far as in the cage, it was around the same spot as well. Did that bring you back to that moment? Um, he didn't bring it back to the moment, but, you know, like I said, I like Joseph. And for him to get knocked out like he did last night, it's part of the sport. It's a nasty sport we play. <clears throat> but it, it didn't remind me of that. It was just like, damn, another knockout. And, you know, Figueroa ended up with, you know, a couple good hammer fists. Shout out to the ref for making it happen so he didn't take any further damage. I think I landed about eight, 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 eight good shots on him. So the ref was a little bit slower last night. I think it was Herb Dean who did it. But good job on the ref last night for only them land, you know, three. So what do you think happens now? Because now the title is vacant. What would you propose? If you were in charge, King Flyweight himself, the cloud, the presence <laughs> forever over this division, what do you do now with this mess of a situation? I mean, I guess you would have to look at to see who's uh, number two and three and then have Figueredo fight that person, I guess. Um, I, I, that's what I, I would do. I mean, I think Joseph, this is his third time at it. It was a vicious knockout. Um, you know, the judges did have him win in the first round. Um, so, I, you know, I think I'll probably go for one and two to fight, and then he can fight whoever. What about Figueredo fighting Henry Cejudo? That's good, but Henry Cejudo's about to fight uh, Jose Aldo. I isn't know. He? Isn't that a crazy fight? I mean, the guy is 0 and 2 in his last two fights. He's 0 and 1 as a bantamweight. He's getting a title shot. What a wacky world this is. It is. It's, it's just like what Max Holloway said. It is what it is. <laughs> yes, it is what it is. That's right. Uh, now, uh, do you keep tabs? Like, do you know about Kaikar France and Oscar Askarov? Do you watch these guys or do you have no idea who these guys are at 125 now? What's the second guy you said? Oscar Askarov. He's really good. Um, I've heard of him. I thought you were talking about Kai Askarov, the guy in uh, Ryzen. Um, um, I don't really keep tabs on those guys. Like I said, uh, when it comes to the flyweight division, I just watch when my, my not my fans, but uh, when my favorite fighters are fighting, like Joseph Benavides, like I said, we have a long history with together, so. Someone called you there, I think. You back? Yeah, yeah I'm back. here. You're I'm back. here. Nobody called. Nobody called. Did, did, did you reach out to him after the fight? No, I'm sure he's got thousands and thousands of people reaching out to him. Um, and for me, you know, I, I don't, if I'm going to reach out to him, I'll do it behind closed doors. But, you know, I'll let the death settle, let him do his thing. He seemed like he's in good spirits. You know, I saw his post. He said, you know, he's going to stay with it and keep on going. At the end of the day, you know, it's not like Joseph sucks. It's, it's part of the game. Like recently from me being at one championship, each time I see athletes lose, even in the Deontay Wilder and uh, Tyson Fury fight, when I see athletes lose now, like I don't look at them and say they suck. I just like it's you. You just lost, and right. that's it. Go back to go back to the gym and train, and 
get back in it. You know, I, I've lost multiple times in my career, and I'm sure I'll, I'll lose again in my career for however long I fight. At the end of the day, as long as I'm able to, you know, keep the lights on and take care of my wife and kids, then you just keep on training. As long as you have a passion and you enjoy it, keep on going. By the way, did you go to a Coldplay concert with Joseph the week of UFC 152 in Toronto, like the week you were fighting him? I think it was, uh, we went there, I think it was, we were doing, um, we we're doing a tour there and we went to the Coldplay. Yeah, wow. we went there. It was a great concert, man. With the guy you were about we, to we fight? We sat right next to you. Yeah, we're about to fight. We sat right next to each other and we we're like, oh, this is awesome. I never heard Coldplay before. And <laughs> Michael Bisping, Michael Bisping was jealous because he's with Tiki. He didn't have a, he didn't have a, a cool uh, date like oh, I did. Oh, that's right. That's when Bisping was at the press conference making fun of you guys, right? Yeah. Exactly. Because, you know, Bisman has a different way of going about his career. You know, I remember him, me and him would sit there and, and talk and he goes, dude, I talk so much shit. I talk so much shit because I'm trying to make as much money as possible. And I don't care if I get knocked out because it happened before, but I'm just trying to make as much money as possible. And I was like, yeah, that's not, not who I am. I'm just here to fight and show I'm the best in the world. So, but me and Bisman, we've we shared many, many moments together through to uh, different fights together, fought in the same card, share the same locker room. So... By the way, tremendous uh, British accent there. You like that, hey? I'm not sure. I mean, you're a great fighter. Maybe the accent needs a little work, if I may say so myself. But uh, I appreciate the the effort. Um, all right. So last thing on this. Would you be sad if they shut down the division? No, not at all. That means more potential fighters for you over at one. Yeah, could potential or, <clears throat> or those guys can go up to 135. I mean, it's not like if they shut down the division, once you're going to be like, come on, guys, come on. Come on, hey, you, yeah. you can't. You get free. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's how it's going to be. I mean, I think one championship is very selected on their athletes that they bring over to the roster. Uh, they want to grab the athletes that fit their uh, their brand the best. So, uh, But I'm sure there's there's a place out there for everybody to go compete. I mean, you look at Sergio Pettis. He's over at Bellator now. Um, you know, you have Ryzen. You have uh, PFL. There's, there's many places. But to be clear, there's not a day that goes by that, that you miss your time there. You're very happy at one. Yeah, absolutely. Very happy with one. Um, like I said, last time I competed in uh, Japan, I, I was playing video games against the world champion in Evo. Um, we got Dota 2 coming up here in Jakarta. Um, so they're building a whole bunch of stuff. And it's also cool to be part of, you know, Giorgio Petrosian. He fought in the uh, Grand Prix. And you also have to get exposed to the Muay Thai um, fan base as well with the Rod Tang and John Haggerty and the list just goes on and amazing athletes, not just in mixed martial arts, but just in, you know, martial arts in general, kickboxing, Muay Thai. And so your next fight comes on April 10th against the current flyweight champion, Adriana Moraes. Um, and I know they've already moved the location of the event because of the coronavirus. Is there any chance that it gets postponed, moved? They just had an event this past Friday in an empty arena what, what are you hearing? Because we're still a little over a month away, but is there any threat of this? I mean, as of right now, the coronavirus is just tearing. You know, not, it's not, I mean, it's just being very impactful, um, not just over in Asia, but also in our current location in Kirkland, Washington. We had um, two deaths here. Um, it's literally, I think that nursing room is about maybe eight minutes away from the gym. Wow. So as long as, you know, I'm, you know, the CDC cannot put any travel ban of us getting out of, you know, Seattle, SeaTac over to Jakarta, which Jakarta hasn't really uh, came out and said they had any cases. But then again, who knows if they're testing over there? Um, I think everything should be good. But I'm praying that uh, everything gets contained and we're able to make it over to Jakarta to go over there and compete. Okay. Do you have any concerns about going over there? No, I don't. I mean, it. it, it is what it is, man. I mean... I just got to make sure I'm healthy and make sure I don't just go out to, you know, large gatherings and just wash my hands and try to stay healthy. I mean, there's always, there's always a concern going over there because the food that I eat over there is totally different than here in America. We have different uh, sanitary, you know, we're, we're way more clean over here in America than they are over in um, Asia. So that's definitely a c concern of mine, but I do the best I can to stay healthy, make sure I drink, you know, bottled water, not... <laughs> the the water from the sink when i brush my teeth i use you know when i went to manila even though the, the the place we stayed at in manila you know my coach was like don't drink that water from the tap when you brush your teeth use a water bottle and that's that's what i did okay uh well i hope everything works out well and that you're able to go over there and fight um i just wanted to ask you about something i saw on your your instagram last week i saw that you posted something where you went and, and taught a class 
Um, and you talked about how when you were in middle school, that's when you fell in love with martial arts and you love kind of doing this sort of thing. And there's a bunch of what appear to be middle school slash high schoolers in the photo. Perhaps I'm getting their ages <laughs> wrong, but like, I can't, am I wrong or are they not? Are they older than that? Did I just mess up? Were they actual like yeah, grown those men? Are, yeah, they're, those are grown men. You know, that really? makes me feel good because that means I no. look big. They looked, they looked very young. Huh? Well, they looked very young. Well, they looked very young. Okay. Well, they didn't look like pro athletes is the point. And to me, it's crazy. Like in what other sport do you have someone like you with your credentials and your resume and what you've done, a legend walk in, you can just learn from this guy. You don't see this in other sports. And so I wanted to know if you do this often and if not, <clears throat> what propelled you to do this? Yeah. So one, for one, that was a uh, Friday night class at AMC Paint Creation. Um, all the people in those, that photo, uh, one of the reasons I love about AMC is that we have people from different walks of life. If you came into AMC, you're not going to see, you know, six-time world champion, Muay Thai fighter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to see a guy who works at Google. You're going to see a guy who works at Microsoft. You're going to see an amateur. You're going to see a couple of amateurs. You see a couple of instructors. So for me, I was just teaching a class Friday night, and I love wrestling. Wrestling's what got me into what's, what I believe it made me mentally tough, made me be a grinder because mixed martial arts is a grind. And so me teaching class that night, brought me back to my roots for like, man, you know, I really enjoy teaching. And for me, it has to be a special group in order for me to teach. Um, you know, I have a buddy of mine, James Yang. Um, he's, I think he's 13, you know, as an amateur, he's even making his debut here, not debut here soon. Um, like a guy like that who, who really wants to thrive and compete on a world level, it makes me, it gets me motivated to teach, to teach them. So that's why I did that post. Uh, granted, they were not children. I'm uh, sorry. Aaron Hawani, they were grown men. I'm sorry. Um, and yes, <laughs> at, at, at AMC Pink Creation, you're not going to have, you know, 65 world champions. It's not going to be a fight factory. It's not going to be anything like that. We, we all share the same passion, which is mixed martial arts. And I think out of, you know, my time being here at AMC, we did at one point have, you know, Mizuno Sakurai, uh, Wiki Nishura, a lot of uh, Tim Boach, Rich Franklin, all those guys coming through. But at, I'll say the last probably six years of my, when I was, a, uh, you know, the flyweight champion of the UFC and even winning the World Grand Prix, I mean, I'm the only professional athlete in the gym who's training. Um, everybody else is, uh, they have passion for it and they work at a real estate agent, Google uh, programmer, Microsoft programmer, etc. DJ, you're the man. Thanks, as always, for coming on. I appreciate your insight. You will forever be that presence, that cloud. And I say this with the utmost respect and uh, trying to give you your props because you deserve that. Thanks for coming on and talking about all this. Appreciate it. And good luck on April 10th. Thanks, Ariel. Have a good night, brother. You too. There he is, the one and only Demetrius Johnson, the first ever UFC flyweight champion, the most decorated champion in UFC history. Great stuff from him, as always. All right, let's move along now. You'll recall uh, two weekends ago, the big story coming out of that weekend was UFC Auckland. It was the very close fight between Dan Hooker and Paul Felder. As I said on the program, I thought Paul Felder won the fight ever so slightly, three rounds to two. But the big story coming out of it was Felder hinting at possibly walking away, never really quite committed to it, but did say that he is considering it. Well, here we are nine days later. We wanted to check in with Paul Felder, who is back and looking great. Back from Auckland. Seems to be all healed up. Oh, we had him there for a second, and uh, now we lost him. But we'll get him back in a second here. All right, he is back. There he is, the one and only Paul Felder. Paul, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you guys? I'm doing. Did you get a call right as I was introducing you? Is that what happened? No, I, I'm just sitting here touching my screen and messing everything up by accident, and then trying to go back in. Oh, no worries. Well, it, so. you look great. <laughs> you look great physically. How are you feeling after that fight nine days later? Oh man, uh, it, it's been a it's been a good recovery. <laughs> um, obviously, I had to stay in Auckland for a few extra days to have my. I looked at, uh, you know, there was a couple little fractures in the orbital and they always want to be safe to, before they send you off flying, you know, 20 hours, 20 plus hours, whatever it is to get back to Philadelphia. Uh, my leg is still really sore, but that's the swelling is healing up there. And uh, the other crazy thing was I ended up getting rhabdo from that fight. What is that? I don't know if you know what that is. It's a condition where your your muscles begin to actually break down and leak into your bloodstream, producing, I think, more myoglobin, and it, it wears on your kidneys, and it turns your urine basically like Coca-Cola color. Oh, no. 
So, yeah, so I went to the hospital for all that other stuff. Uh, and I went and, you know, I had to take a pee at the hospital before I sat there for hours. And uh, I was like, oh, that's not good. And I knew what it was right away. I'd heard about this disorder from like CrossFit athletes and things like that, guys that just kind of push it to the limit. And yeah, so I had to stay a little longer to make sure my, my kidneys were uh, oh my functioning properly. Has that ever happened to you before? You know what? It's happened a couple of times where I thought I was peeing blood from like body shots, but I, I'm starting to think maybe I'm just pushing it and with the weight cut and then rehydrating and then pushing it again. You know, maybe it's just been taking its toll on the old, uh, the old kidneys. So now when you go to the, the restroom, does the same thing still happen or is that going? No, 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 no. It's, it's pretty quick. Uh, to, okay. They basically just fl flush your system, flush your kidneys. Uh, so they gave me like five, five bags of IV, all of course administered in a hospital and under the uh, watchful eye of, you know, USADA knows what's going on. So yes, 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 of course. But yeah, it's just, my God, you know, one of these days I'm going to fight and not, uh, or maybe not, and, uh, not end up in the ER. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the fight was incredible and the shots that you took and the heart that you displayed was amazing. I'm wondering how many, how many donuts have you had since the fight? So, so Ian Larios, who's uh, my nutritionist and does all my weight cuts, he showed up with my my teammate who was with me, showed up and brought like three uh, dozen Krispy Kreme donuts to oh the hospital that I was staying at. <laughs> so by the next day, I, I probably had already had about 14 Krispy Kreme donuts. And I, today... <sighs> I was going to be good today. It was Monday. I was like, oh, I'm going to get back on the trying to eat mostly healthy. I had six filled donuts. This, this <laughs> six donuts just today. And it's two 30 Eastern time to the face. Oh, to the face. Look at that. Well done. Hey, well my done. metabolism is purging still, but it's not going to last. It's not going to last much longer, bro. I can tell you right now. I can feel it starting to swell up in my blood. I got to start working out again. Could you even get out of bed? Yeah, I just went for a two mile walk before I took this oh, call with you. Well done. Well done. Uh, have you rewatched the fight? But, yeah. I did. I watched it once. And what do you I think? I watched it once on my, on my phone. I, I, I think I won the fight. How'd you score it? I think it was, I, I scored it three rounds, two, four, and five to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can argue other rounds, I thought. But you can also argue rounds for, for, for Dan. It depends on how you're watching it, what you're scoring. I had that close fight with Edson, man. I, I, I feel I won the fight. I feel like I went in there into enemy territory and did what I needed to do. I really feel like I, if that's in Vegas or, God forbid, Philadelphia, I, I, I think I walk with that decision every time. Well, one of the hot topics this past month, as you know, is open scoring. In a situation like this, so close, do you wish there was open scoring? Yeah, I do. So I, I, I can know how hard I really got to go out there. And uh, but I don't think it would have really mattered. The one it was one judge that gave the judge that gave him round five. They were all over the place. These guys. Uh, but one of them, two of them gave him a five to me. And I think if I'd gotten that third judge to also agree that I won five, I'd have won the fight. And I went in there round five as if I needed to knock him out anyway. So I don't think that would have really changed too much. I went into that final round like I got a. I got to put a stamp on this. And then obviously he got that, that takedown at the end of the fight. But I, I remember in my head saying, I'm not going to let him just have this takedown, no matter how much time is left. Because if I can just freaking get back up to my feet and show these people that I, even though I think I had that round in the bag and there was not much time left, even on my back, I was elbowing and trying to get back up to my feet and then even throwing back elbows. I really thought I, 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 you know, I put a stamp on it and let the judges know I won, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit here and, and cry about it. That's not why I talked about retirement. You know, it's, it's all the other things that are going on. It's just, you know. And and we'll get to that in a second. But I just want to say, as I've repeated a million times over the past two weeks or so, a takedown shouldn't score you points. A takedown per the new unified rules, is just a change in position if you do nothing with it. So if you take someone down and they pop back up as you did, that should not be the deciding factor. And it drives me nuts when people say he stole the round with the takedown. No, that's not how this yeah. works. So, I, But I actually think in this case, it did work against you. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. I think that is what ultimately made that judge give him round five. 
uh, instead of me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous, but again, you know, something's got to be figured out. It's not just me and Dan, you know, the me and Edson fight scores were all over the place. We just saw recently, there's been some scores that are just don't even make sense. Clearly another fighter won and they give it to another guy. Judges are getting caught looking at their cell phones and, and not watching the action. So, uh, this is just another example of, of, you know, proving that we need to get some things more concrete on how we're going to break down the criteria of what wins a fight. So the big question now is nine days later, have you made a decision about your future? You know, it's, I got, I got a little emotional on there and I really have been thinking about like how many more do I have left? I have not been thinking about, hanging the gloves up during training camp or thinking that I'm out of contention for really making a run for this division. But it's been on my mind at 35. I'm turning 36 in April. My, my daughter is getting a lot older. She's realizing when I'm gone and, and missing me a lot more. But uh, I, I think at this point, it's safe to say I'm only coming back for things that really uh, entice me, man. Things that are going to make me train the way I did for this fight. Five round fights, big, huge uh, matchups with somebody that excite me. Other than that, I'll, I'll just do commentary and wait for that matchup. But I talked to Sean Shelby and, you know, they said some nice things to me. They didn't push me one way or the other whatsoever. They just, uh, kind of congratulated me on a crazy fight and said that, you know, we're going to be calling you and we hope you answer. So in your heart of hearts, do you think you fought your last fight? No. What is that fight that you think gets you back? Yeah, well, obviously, if something were to happen to, to one of these guys in the top five and they can't match up the way the UFC wants them to match up, uh, there's been some talk of uh, Ally Aquinta wanting to fight me. And, uh, you know, you give me a five-rounder with him and, and a big fight night or a rematch with Hooker, which will never happen. And um, But obviously, that's something I would take to, to, to get that one back. Um, any of the top five, Ally Aquinta is a fun fight just because that fight was supposed to happen like three different times and it never quite did. And he's mentioned he wants it, but it's got to, it would have to be some main event somewhere for me to even want to do that. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I'm not coming back for, you know, the last fight on the prelims or even like the second fight of a pay-per-view. I was like, nah, and it's nothing against them. It's not saying I deserve all these extra things. It's just to go through what I go through and put myself through in training. And then you see how, I push myself in the fight. You can't deny that anymore, that when I show up, I'm going to put on a goddamn show for everybody, including the UFC. So I just feel like I deserve to be put in the spots that uh, that I'm warranted. And I feel like after that main event, proving that I can that I can promote it, that I can hype it up, and then I can execute, that I should only be getting, you know, exciting ma- matchups from, from here on out. When you mention the hooker rematch, why do you say that'll never happen? But just because I feel like, you know, he he technically won the fight. I feel like it was close enough where, I, I'm again, I'm not complaining about this decision. I'm not sitting here and, and taking anything away from that guy. We shared something very special in there for five rounds, and he was just as gritty as I was. But I feel like he's going to take that and try to fight Poirier, or he's going to fight somebody above him. And I feel like that's not a bad thing. That's meant to happen. You know what I mean? If that was my case, somebody said to me, would you want to rematch? with Dan, if you had gotten that decision based on that same exact fight, and hell no. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, I, if I'm walking away with my hand raised and I got that dub, I'm trying to fight Poirier or Gaethje too. Right, that, that is fair. And I, and I appreciate that perspective. Did you know that you were going to do that? Like I, I saw right as the, the judge's decision was announced, you started to you know take the tape off the gloves. And, I, and for a second, I was like, oh no. And then they went away from you and then they came back and, and then you did what you did. Was that something you were thinking about or was it just like, was the first time that that crossed your mind in that moment, you hadn't been thinking about that all camp long? You know, I'm a pretty dramatic, uh, <laughs> well, you're an actor, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. So, you know, I kind of always think about that moment just as I always think about what having the belt put around my waist would be like and, and taking that back to Philly or fighting, you know, at the Wells Fargo center in Philadelphia. Uh, and doing or bringing the belt to the Eagles, you know, stadium at the link and, and hanging out with I, I fantasize about all these things and retirement's just another one of them. And it's not in any bad way. I, I read some reporter saying like, if he's even mentioning 
off the tip of his tongue that he's going to retire, he should do it. I'm like, oh, that's that's kind of BS. That doesn't really make sense because I think about that since I first fought my pro fight, and I was like, why the hell? I think about it every time I'm backstage. I say to every one of my cornermen over and over again, why the are we here? You know, you've heard it a million times now. Guys are being more honest about what goes on backstage with us and how nerve-wracking it is and it's the, the torture we put ourselves through waiting in those locker rooms. So, yeah, it's crossed my mind. And, I, that, you know, that moment almost seemed right. But, nah, I, I still, I think I got a lot more left in me physically, man. I'm already recovering from the, from one of the hardest battles of my life. And, yeah, that shit was, it's addictive, man. That, that five rounds, that main event, I liked it. I liked being on the poster. I liked it being about me and him and, and I'm, you know, the USA versus New Zealand over there. It was, uh, yeah, look at that. Look at that foot. Yeah. Oh my God. Any Ooh, surgery? No, uh, I get the final results results on my eye. Um, I just got the uh, CAT scan done again today. Um, I should be fine. Wow. That is amazing. By the way, what, what happened in this scene here? What did you guys talk about? What a great photo this is. Legendary <laughs> stuff. What did you guys talk about? I, I knew he was behind me, so I just kept yelling, Dan, Dan, we got to get a picture. And he was beyond respectful and cool we sat there we chatted for a little bit and just kind of looked at each other for a while there man like yo we just we just did something pretty special brother you know what i mean and i said hey i'm sorry you know i really didn't mean anything disrespectful to your family whatsoever uh it wasn't ever about that but again i said it before the fight it was a fight we were hyping it sometimes we get a little mad at each other we're gonna fist fight i knew me and dan were gonna put on a show like that whether we liked each other or didn't like each other, but it did add to the drama, you know, before the weigh-ins when they were mentioning me talking about his name and him getting all heated. I was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> now, now I get to face the music. You know what I mean? Here we are. And, uh, God damn, it was, man, that walkout. I don't know if you guys saw Brian Butler posted yeah. from behind that man. <laughs> Gives me chills coming out to born in the USA. And, uh, it's got it. That's why it would be tough to retire, man. I, I'm sitting here smiling, thinking about even though my body was beat to crap from that fight. It, man, going into the fourth and fifth round when Duke's like, this is, this is it. These are championship rounds right now. I'm like, whew. You talk about it. You know, it's easy to talk about these five rounders. and Hey, I'm in shape for five rounds. Yeah, we see a lot of guys say that, right? But right. I showed up in shape for five rounds. Yeah, no, it was incredible. Um, and just the way you're speaking about it, like you can't walk away now, right? You can't walk away like that. Just you don't seem like a guy who's done. Just the way you're speaking. Look at your smile. You're just like you love this. <laughs> <laughs> I do love it, man. Of course I do. But you know what I hate? I hate coming home with headaches and, and broken faces and swollen legs. But my daughter's been great. You know, we've all been just hanging out, eating donuts, and uh, you know, I let her take off some days from school this week. So it's I, I call it the week of debauchery, Ariel. The first <laughs> week after after the fight, I can do whatever I want calorie wise, right? So I have been like, for example, you want to hear a little bit Please. about yesterday before yes. I get off of here? Oh yes, I love it. All right. So I still had some box of those Tim Tams, those biscuits, the chocolate covered biscuits they have over there, the Tim Tam slams, and you hear about these? Yes, things? yes, yes. I probably had about a box and a half of those yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> an entire giant Kit Kat, like a big, big one from over there that I froze and brought over with me. Uh, probably most of a pint of uh, gelato, uh, a grilled cheese at like 12 o'clock at night, <laughs> uh, homemade macaroni and cheese that my mom made for me. Oh, yes. Uh, we went to, I went to Federal Donuts in the morning. We, I probably ate about five donuts there. They're like cake donuts. And I split uh, split a chicken sandwich, fried chicken sandwich, and then probably a whole bunch of Hershey Kisses and some other stuff throughout the day. Well deserved. Well deserved. That's impressive. I wonder if it would That's be easy. That's stopping soon. It's stopping soon. Hey, and I don't do you. encourage any of you fighters out there to binge the way. Do that you, man? Yeah. <laughs> Live your best life. I wonder if it would be easier on you. I know you love it over there at, at Rufus Sport, but if you could train in Philadelphia, do you think that would take some pressure off of you and you wouldn't miss your, your daughter well, as much? Well, it has gotten easier, right? I, I do have a team here now. I'm back with Daniel Gracie and uh, Coach John uh, and Jonathan Webb as well. Like I have 
Tom Brady is, you know, one of my main teammates here. Jonathan Webb. We got Pat Sabatini, a bunch of really good uh, guys that are just breaking into the UFC or haven't gotten there yet. But it's, uh, I think part of it is me getting away and being isolated and being, being old school about, you know, how boxers used to go away for their training camps and kind of isolate themselves up in, you know, a cabin and just, you're just there for training. It's just, I did a long one this time because it was my first five rounder, so I didn't want to really mess around with it. So I did a full eight weeks away. So that was a little tough, but I think it's so important, man. I think, uh, you know, I only got a couple more years left max, so it's something we're all going to have to deal with and, until I decide uh, it's not how I want to make money anymore. And, and if you stop going to Rufus Sport, that means we, we don't get the Bilal Muhammad videos of uh, him imitating yeah, you, and well, those are just tremendous, right? You have to love those, right? Oh, God. The first one that I saw, I wasn't ready for it. And uh, my teammate and boy, Craig Eckelberg was like, yo, have you seen what Bilal put on uh, Twitter or Instagram? <laughs> I was like, I got all serious for a second. Like, oh, like well, what happened? Like, what did he say? I went on, and it was him doing his first Pauly Paul uh, impression. <laughs> I was literally uh, almost peed my pants laughing out loud at that one. Tremendous. Uh, you're you're going to be joining us in Las Vegas for 248. Yeah, yeah. I, how uh, the hell are you doing that? I have no idea why, how you're doing this, but apparently you're an analyst, so I wanted to mention that as well. I'm ready. I'm you know I'm excited <laughs> for this card. I'm excited to I'm excited to work. Wait, Eric, you got to realize, like I told you, the week of debauchery will turn into let's be honest, two or three weeks of sure. debauchery because I've got I've got Vegas with you guys on the desk, and then I'm working color with. Uh, my British compadres over over for the London card as well, and you know Duke will be there working with Tyrant. So I, just, I won't be fighting anytime soon at 155. That, I, that okay. I <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear you're doing okay. You're in good spirits, and that you have some fighting left in you. Uh, again, great performance. I thought you won ever so slightly. I know how these things go. You're handling like like the true pro with all class as you usually do. And I told you, right? I told you at the Edson fight that I would handle this yep. like a man. Yep. Yep. There you go. Paul, I, I appreciate cried. it. And I will see you in Las Vegas. I'll see you soon, sir. Thanks for having me on. All right. There he is, Paul Felder. Great point there at the very end. Great point at the very end about how Edson and his team handled the loss in Abu Dhabi and how he is handling the loss coming off of the uh, the close one against Dan Hooker. This is where you'll see Paul Felder all weekend long on all these shows. Look at that, UFC Live, pre-show, Ariel and the Bad Guy, post-show, all that and more. And if you want to learn more about Paul Felder's acting background, including uh, hearing from his acting professor and some of his fellow actors from back in the day, I do suggest checking out Mark Ramundi's great story on ESPN.com. It came out before the fight, but it's a, uh, a really great look at where this man has been and the journey to get to this point, and I'm happy to hear that he is going to continue fighting. Now, speaking of UFC 248, one of the more intriguing fights on the preliminary card involves this man, Deron Wynn, going up against Gerald Mearshart. Big fight for him coming off his very first pro loss, and of course, we recall back in October in Boston, unfortunately, he missed weight prior to that fight, so there's a lot at stake here. There he is, Deron Wynn joining us, coming off a big weekend for the Gilroy High School Mustangs with their guy, That's right. Aldade, winning the state championship. Finished seventh, but I understand you guys were hit with a bunch of injuries, so everyone's happy, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's up, Ariel, first of all? And, Hello, uh, yeah, it was solid. It was solid, man. But uh, we, uh, yeah, we went to the state tournament without two of uh, our state placers, two top four guys in the state, and that's a lot of points left on the board. So, But other than that, for the most part, we wrestled really tough and uh, wrestled to our capability. So uh, I'm happy, man. And, of course, the head coach uh, for the Gilroy High School Mustangs is the great Daniel Cormier. He's so involved, so dedicated to the team. You're by his side throughout it all. It's really great to see what you guys have done with those kids. And uh, a nice table setter, if you will, for this weekend for you. Massive opportunity, biggest fight card that you've ever fought on. And, as I said, the stakes are big considering what happened in October. So let's talk about October. What happened? Why did you miss weight? Um, I, well, first of all, I'll be honest. Um, I've always been bad at cutting weight my entire mm. life, man. Uh, I've cut weight since I was eight years old, you know, and, uh, it's just always kind of been something that's kind of been my downfall. And, um, I don't know what it was. I think that this new way of cutting weight, uh, cause you know, 
as a wrestler, we've always been known to like just not eat or 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 not drink water, kind of dehydrate yourself, whatever. And now with like water loading and stuff, and my first cut went so smooth that I think I got too comfortable. And then I came in a fight week a little bit heavier. Um and uh and then when it when it came down to it, I was too heavy. And uh and it just really messed with me mentally. And it, for the most part, a lot of times a, a weight cut comes down to the mental aspect of things. And, uh, you know, it's no excuse. I was unprofessional, man. So um, uh, I got things under control this time, though. And I'm really, uh, you know, I, I definitely took a, a big stand in that for this camp. And uh, I came in a lot, lot lighter this this camp. I'm actually in Vegas already. I got here last night. So, oh, nice. Um, I, yeah, I feel great, man. I actually, I drove back from Bakersfield uh, to San Jose about three hours yesterday morning. And I packed all my stuff up and I flew into Vegas last night. So uh, I kind of like to get here a little early so I can just kind of relax today. I already ran and relax and I should be getting my first meal here soon and um, uh, get ready to go for the rest of the week. Uh, how much do we weigh on Monday? I'd rather not share. Why? I don't know. I just, uh, I, I don't want... Uh, I don't know. I don't want to make any 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 mistakes over here. You know what I mean. So, All right. uh, but you feel good. Uh, but I'm good. I feel great, man. I, I'm I I shrank my body. Uh, I feel really good. Okay, so then you have that, but then of course you have an opportunity to fight the fight, win the fight, but it didn't go your way. So how did you deal with that? Like when you left Boston, there was some bad blood between you and Darren Stewart, right? When you left Boston, how did you deal with not only missing weight but losing your first pro fight? Um, it was tough because I'm a competitor. Um, when I was out there, it just, it, uh, and this is like, I, I'm not one to make excuses, but it just wasn't me. Um, I, I was thinking all these negative thoughts in my head in between rounds and, 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 and even during the fight. And, uh, and that's just like, you know, I kind of, I made a vlog about it and that one I was talking, I was going to talk to you about, but, uh, it, uh, it, it was tough, man. But, you know, and then you get, you get all these people, it was a split and then, there's a lot of people who said I won and, but it's like, it doesn't matter because obviously I came out with a loss, but at the end of the day, it was good for me. Um, if I would have snuck that one out, maybe I would lose a little bit more focus. I don't know. You know, uh, I'm, I'm competitive and I've, and I've always been a determined guy, but the loss was maybe the best thing that could have happened to me because it it actually this camp I was probably 10 times more professional um with my training and my dedication and my nutrition and you know just small things like running and and getting all the extra workouts in that I was supposed to so um uh it was hard but I'm a competitor at heart so um uh I I think that I've made the necessary changes to not allow that to happen again but I also do feel like the missing weight was a huge, huge emotional drain for me hmm. because as a wrestler, um, if you miss weight, it is a much more kind of um, embarrassing, you know, situation. Hmm. You know, in MMA world, it kind of happens more often. And, and I guess, you know, it's kind of looked down upon, especially with my height and stuff like that. But um uh, it, it really drained me bad, like emotionally, you know, I was embarrassed, uh, because, uh, because I know it wasn't a good look. So, um, it, it drained me a lot and I, you know, I knew I needed to win the fight, but I don't think that I could muster up that energy and that kind of, um, uh, you know, spunk that I needed to, to be able to, uh, to get the job done. And, and it really weighed down on me and I fatigued out there and I was, you know, I just kind of was flat and, kind of just zombie mode and you know it just uh it really wasn't me man so I, I would like to say that was that was you know they say you wouldn't beat me on my worst night and that was my worst night you know so um i'd like to think that i made the changes to make that not happen again coming off all of that now you're you're no longer undefeated do you feel a little different going into this fight do you feel like there's more pressure is this and you know, they're all must win right you always have to win whenever you're a pro fighter but yeah. do you feel like there's different stakes you're more nervous more pressure how are you reacting to all this not necessarily more pressure um but it's definitely higher stakes you know um when you come off you're undefeated and i get a fight of the night and uh you know 
um, you know, kind of a little hype around my name. Um, it's a lot easier to go into a fight, not worried about things, but now you got to worry about, you know, my contract's about up, if I lose again, what's the UFC going to think, I know all that stuff. But um, I think about those things a lot uh, during training and it helps motivate me and it helps um, uh, get me through the nerves or, or the pressure, you know what I mean? So, um, I'm, I'm okay. I'm in a really good place in my mind and my body. So, uh, you know, I, this dude's been trying to like, kind of get at me oh. and, uh, it's, it just, I'm not concerned with this dude. And it's just like I say with any other, um, any other opponent, like a guy like him, I mean, he's one in three in his last fights. So if I don't beat this dude, then maybe this ain't for me, you know, but, um, I, uh, I feel uh, I feel very confident that uh, I'm going to do what it takes to get the job done in a, in, in a lot of ways, you know. So um, I still have a lot of learning and growing to do as a as a mixed martial artist, but uh, I've definitely made jumps, and I feel like I make jumps every camp. And uh, uh, there's a lot of things that um, I think I'm going to be able to showcase on Saturday night that a lot of people didn't know I had in me. Wait, so are you saying there's a possibility if you lose this fight, you're going to retire? No, 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 no. Like, I'm talking about, I mean, shit, there's like 600 people on the roster, right? People are trying to get signed every day. It, maybe if I don't pin out, I mean, what? I mean, maybe I get that snip, you know? I've seen a lot of dudes get get uh, get snipped after uh, their second straight loss, you know? Okay. Um, I, I'd like to think that I, I'd be a little different, you know? And then and then what? Then what do you do? Then you got to start, you know, it, there's a lot of a lot of variables that come into it if, you lo- if I lose. Okay. Now, and, uh, you mentioned Gerald's trying to get at you. What do you mean by that? I don't know. Just like saying corny ass shit online, like like, oh. like Instagram and Twitter and trying to like trying to get a rise out of me. But he's commenting I mean, on your all... posts. Is no, he... he's just like making posts about me and shit, oh. like tagging me and shit. Ah. But it's like that's all that's all fun and games till we fight Saturday night, bro. You know, like these people laughing and these Twitter, these Twitter trolls and all that shit that, that that's like hyping you up and making you feel better about yourself. That's all fun and games until we actually get into the cage on Saturday night and I'm smashing your face in. You know what I mean? So so you you can laugh and, and make all those jokes until you're getting smashed, you know? So it's cool. I'm I'm cool with it. I'm I'm far from stressed from this dude. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong. Are, are you and Darren cool now? You and Darren Stewart? Because I saw him like post things on your Instagram encouraging you. Yeah, no, I mean, he's a good dude, man. Uh, I actually like him. It's just, as, like I said, as a competitor, it's very uh, tough pill for me to swallow. I actually had to tell him, like, bro, I can't pretend that I'm like your homie now. It's just not the move, bro. Like, I see, <laughs> I understand, I understand good sportsmanship, and, I, and, and I'm all for it, especially coming from a wrestling background, but you can't sit here as a man and, a, you know, and a competitor um, with the pride, like sit here and be like, yeah, me and Darren are cool now. Ha ha ha. Jokes fun. You know, I think I commented some, he like put a highlight video on his Instagram and at the, it was all cool. And then the very end, it was like him hitting me. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah, that shit was cool to the very end. Ha yeah. ha, you know? Yeah. But, um, there, there's also like, I don't want like, like there's, there's like a set of like middleweights or something. And I don't know, I, I know there's like Instagram groups where you guys all promise to like comment on, on each other's stuff, right? And it's just kind of like a bond you have. I know that's like a lot of different groups do that. And there's like a group of dudes like who do that. And I, and I, it, for the life of me, I can't understand it. And so I actually had to tell Darren and I like him and I, I wish him the best of luck. And I want the rematch. I, I would love to be able to find my way back to him. Um, but, uh, I can't sit here and be like, yeah, bro, sick workout. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, that shit's <laughs> that shit's corny to me, bro. Yeah, you know? I see where and you're so, and I don't, coming from. I, I don't get why they do it. So I, I, uh, I, uh, I had to kind of like back away from that of of, of us trying of us like looking like homies now, you know? Because I feel like I look like kind of a bitch if I'm like, cool with the dude now. Yeah, you know I mean, like, dog, you just whoop my ass on ESPN, bro. Like, <laughs> nah, this ain't. We ain't cool, G. <laughs> I get, I get that. By the way, uh, DC is calling, 
the fight on Saturday. D- does that annoy you? Like, would you? For the second time. I know, second time. No, I'm gonna let him do it. I know. What's up with this dude, Ariel? <laughs> I, you know, like I, I said something to him like a week ago, or a couple weeks ago, and I was like, "Are you calling the fight?" And he was like, "Yeah, but uh, you know, I, Ariel, you know DC." And he was like, "He was like, yeah, but I mean, if you want me to back out and, and corner you or something, just let me know." You know, I was like, "Yeah, all right, that'll happen." You know what I mean? Like that'll never happen, bro. But wouldn't that be so great I, to I have him in I your corner, right? It would, but um, that's also though. You know, we have to. Me and DC have to skate the fine line of um, me just being all DC hype. You know what I mean? Like, I can't just be like riding his coattails all the time. Like, I have to be my own guy. Like, that's okay. People call me mini DC and shit like that. I, I, I probably am never gonna get away from that. But I can't be like. It can't be like, and he has DC in his corner. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I I, I have to have my own entity, bro. And and that's the only way I'm going to be able to get to where I I essentially want to be. So um, that's my boy, man. And Arrow, you of all people know that we are so much, me and him are so much more than just this fighting. Like, dude, that's my brother, bro. So, um, you know, in day-to-day life. So, um, uh, but I have to kind of, we kind of have to separate, uh, where we're at with that because it's just uh i think it's a smarter move but you know i can't take this dude's money away from him they and the ufc loves him and he's been busy with wrestling and stuff like that so i'm gonna let him call the fights it, at least he's gonna be here you know he's gonna be here in a couple of days and he's gonna help with the cut and stuff like that so um that's all positives so i i'm okay with it at first i thought it was gonna be kind of weird and, and even if you could listen to the last fight you can tell it, in certain points you know he's the best at being professional mm. and at certain points you could tell that he, he was kind of silent and kind of like bro what is he doing you know what i mean so uh you know that's that i know that's tough for him but um like i said it, it, it i find it very hard to believe that this fight's going to go like my last one um i'm very confident that it won't so um i think it'll be a, a different turnout by the way, what's going on with you and Tai Tui Vasa? Is there a bit of a rivalry brewing there? Is I mean, it's so fascinating that he's no. at the gym and after Justin Willis yeah. and everything, and now you're going, what are you doing? Are you doing this for Justin? What's happening here? No, no, this is my, this is all fun and games, bro. Okay. I like Ty. He's a good ass dude. And he was kind of one of the pe- persons that like, as soon as he came to the gym, we clicked. Okay. You know, like from the first like 10 minutes I met him, we were laughing. So no, that's my boy, man. That's that, I like Ty. He fits in so good at the gym. That's all fun and games, bro. We're just all and you know we all just talk shit to each other at the gym, and it, it's all fun. Ty's cool, man, and he's gonna be here for the fight too. So uh, he he fits in well, you know. Uh, the big pretty thing, um, that's between them, and you know I I don't want to come on here and like sh- you know slander uh, big pretty, but it, you know he was uh, Ty has already kind of formed this family vibe with us and um that's kind of never what big pretty was so um it's just a different maybe he he fits in you know maybe maybe justin fits in better at a different gym and ty fits in better here i don't know but um uh you know i was never really close with justin either so uh you know it's hard for me to get emotionally attached to something i'm i'm not really invested in so uh i like ty as for now that's my dude so um all right uh, and I hope I hope he sticks around. And I think he's I think he said something about like maybe you know staying here. I know he's working on his grappling and his wrestling, but now he's just a fun dude to be around. Must be amazing to get ready for a fight of this magnitude for you, and then all of a sudden you get this uh, Dagestani invasion, right? You get Khabib and Makhachev and all these guys. And I saw that you mentioned yeah. Makhachev, best grappler you've ever rolled with, with all the guys DC, all these guys. How could you say such a thing? I saw who did, uh, was it Crutchmer who said in the in the comments, "What about me? Well, can I yeah, get some yeah. love? What's going on?" Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Islam, bro, what people don't understand, um, you know, he's kind of like hiding in Habib's shadow a little bit, right? Uh, but, dude, he is a monster. Like, when he shows up to AKA, like, when he they showed up, like, two weeks ago, he was pushing almost 190 pounds, like, straight monster. And then, so they've been doing sambo and grappling their entire life. I'm talking about all-around grappling. Right. We always feud about us wrestling and stuff like that. And and if he can beat me in wrestling, like on our feet, you know, takedowns. Um, but on the mat rolling, I think pound for pound. And I've rolled with a lot of black belts. And, you know, I, I probably I haven't rolled with I don't think I've ever rolled with like a black belt world champion. But 
Islam is very, very impressive, and I've watched him roll against a lot of very, very impressive guys, and I've he's uh he he's uh he's as good as it gets, I think, man. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to this, Duran. Good luck to you. Good luck this week as far as everything Thanks, going down in Vegas, the weight cut and all that stuff. And, of course, good luck on Saturday. Big fight for you. I, uh, I, I look forward to being there in person. I can't wait. Yeah, when you get here, Ariel. I get when there, get there uh, Thursday. So that's when the action really you know, pops off, as the kids like to say. Yeah, I feel you, big guy. All right. Talk to you later, Duran. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. See you, see you buddy. All right. There he is. Duran Wynn, kind enough to join us. Big fight. On Saturday, UFC 248 against Gerald Mearshot. The prelims are great. They've got uh, Rodolfo Vieira. We've got uh, Mark Madsen. The return of Sean O'Malley as well. So that goes down this Saturday. Now, one more story we have to touch on from this past Saturday. A guy who knows Duran quite well. A uh, former teammate of his over at the American Kickboxing Academy. Luis Pena had a big victory on Saturday, but he had a bigger week than that. He met his biological father and brother. He's talked about this journey of his on this program, meeting his biological mother several months ago as well. Well, look at this, meeting his biological brother um, last week and, and embracing him after the victory. I can't imagine the emotion uh, going through his body after something. Like this. I mean, you could see it right there, right? Here's what he had to say about the big week that he had in Norfolk following the victory. I had this revelation kind of sitting there looking at him and thinking to myself, like, you know, this this 20 year old kid's looking at me as a 26 year old grown man for advice and, and you know, um, you know, validation and stuff. And I I remember when I was his age and I never thought I'd be here, you know, with uh, with someone like like my, with someone like that looking up to me, wanting those kind of answers and things from me and uh Kind of made me a little bit emotional before I got in the fight, but it also helped me kind of ground myself. That courtesy of the UFC, and here he is, Luis Pena, picked up a nice victory over Steve Garcia on Saturday. Unanimous decision victory. He's kind enough to join us right now. Luis, how are you, my man? I'm doing great, Ariel. Uh, just got back from a meeting with my managers at First Round Management. Um, we're actually, we just got, we were just got done talking about what we we're going to do next. So uh, I'm actually in a re in really great mood. Wow. Okay. Well, we'll get to next in a moment, but first, I mean, I can't, I saw afterwards, like you were apologizing for your performance. I can't imagine how kind of emotionally draining that whole week was. You're, you're, you meet your dad for the first time, your biological dad, your biological brother, they're in attendance, you get a victory coming off a loss. I mean, that has to have been one of the more draining weeks of your career, right? That actually wasn't the first time I've met my biological dad. Um, we met after my year Luis, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt you, but I think that you're covering the uh, the microphone on your phone. Oh, my bad. There you go. So what I was saying is, I met my. I, that wasn't actually the first time I had met my biological father. I met him after my UFC debut, um, but it was the first time I had met my biological little brother on his side. And yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would say emotionally draining. Just it was. It was quite a, an emotional roller coaster, and I really haven't been able to. Uh, to get over it. I still kind of find myself uh, welling up thinking about everything that's gone on and thinking about all the uh, the implications of it all. But at the same time, um, you know, my life's got to move on. It was just uh, an odd revelation sitting there. It's like I said in the, in the, uh, the little package you showed before I came on. Um, I, could, I could just see in my brother's face uh, Saturday at lunch before the fight, we, were, we sat down and talked one-on-one -on -one just about life and how things have been for both of us uh, growing up, you know, each other's interests and, and things that have gone on in each other's lives since then. And, you know, I could see in his face the same look I used to give some of my older best friends when I, I would ask them for advice, for life advice and, and just and, and things like of that nature. And... It, I just had this revelation uh, sitting there in front of him. He didn't even realize it. I was like, man, I uh, maybe I have matured a little bit, grown a little bit, and, and maybe I, I am, you know, I'm not a kid anymore. It's weird. And, and how did the meeting come about? Um, well, they, my brother goes to Old Dominion, so he attends the school that the fight was on. So when uh, they told me I was fighting in Norfolk, which my dad lives out there too, 
I reached out to him and was like, hey, I'm fighting in Norfolk. Let's, let's set up the meeting between me and Legend. Let's figure it out. And, uh, you know, everyone was on board. My dad was really um, supportive of it. His mom was supportive of it. And uh, I'm just glad we got the chance to do it. Man, because I remember um, in the third round, I fell into the triangle choke. And it got tight. It got real tight. You know what I'm saying? Like, there was a point where I was like, fuck, I, I might go out. And then right after I thought to myself, like, dude, you might go out. I was like, no, no. We can't do this not in front of my little brother like no this is not happening in front of my little brother and i just found like in 10 miles, i didn't know how i was gonna do it out of the right then and there i just more. found my way out wow so he gave you inspiration to keep on going drive motivation no without a doubt like i i legitimately i i was in my mind telling myself like no we're not we're not a about to to let this happen in front of him we're not gonna tap we're not gonna go to sleep we're figuring it out and we did you know it, it was it was like one of those movie moments, you know. You you never feel like that's that at, like those things actually happen until you're there. Mm. Why were you unhappy with your performance? Was it because you got you know almost caught in that triangle? Was it something else? Because it seemed like you were apologetic afterwards. Man, I don't want to go out there and hold on to a win. I I don't want to just you know. That those aren't the kind of fights I like to have. If you you if you've watched me fight, I, I like to go out there and be exciting. I like to, but you know, hats off to Steven. He's a great competitor, and he showed me things that I wasn't prepared for, and I had to completely change my game plan on the fly right then and there, and just go back to what I know and and get the win. So hats off to him. But um, to say that I. I was thrown off by the fact that I had spent 10 weeks preparing for a five foot nine wrestler and having my opponent change to a six foot striker on the week of the fight. It, it definitely threw things off. I, uh, especially going in there, you know, in the week leading up, you know, you tell yourself, Oh, it doesn't matter. It, uh, you're, you know, no matter what he does, I'm going to go out there and do the same thing. But then it's not until you get in there and you've got a completely new opponent in front of you that you you realize, like, oh, I, I can't just use the same game plan on him and, uh, and attempt and, and feel and think that I'm going to uh, just be successful, you know? And, of course, you were supposed to fight Alex Munoz. He pulled out due to injury, and that's where Garcia came in. You also prepared for this fight uh, at ATT in Florida, not AKA. Why the switch? Um, I hate to say it, but I ran into some financial troubles because living in Silicon Valley can get extremely expensive. It got to a point where I couldn't really find anything less than like 2600 a month. And I just couldn't do it um, with, you know, based off my salaries and everything off my purse. I, I, I couldn't uh, figure it out with training and food, like just having to put myself together. And I was I was going through a lot of stress trying to figure out how I was going to make things work. And then uh, I, I talked to my manager, Malki Kawa, and we, we kind of figured out what we were going to do. And he's the one that kind of suggested, like, hey, if you go to ATT, they'll take care of everything for you. And I I went to my coaches at AKA, and I told them the situation I was in. I told them, like, look, I'm over here dying. Like, I'm over here uh, – a detriment to my training and my performance in the room because I'm so stressed out on the financial side of they, they gave me their blessing to go to, to come here to Florida to change my scenery up and just to get back on my feet so I can figure it out. Um, I, I talk with Rosendo quite a bit still. I, I try to keep in touch with him and uh, we still have a good relationship. I still want to have him out my corner. I still want to bring him. I, I still want to have a, a working relationship with him. We're figuring it out, but I'm not gonna lie. I do enjoy being here at ATT. I enjoy uh, my training partners. I love my coaches. I really feel like here at American Top Team, not only do they believe in me, but they 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 know what they have on their hands, and they know that I can be the champion one day. Wow. Okay. So you're gonna stick around. Most definitely. Okay. Um, and so you just said that you came out of a meeting with your your management talking about the future. What did you guys? talk about what did you decide on uh, it was very very bright you know um, 
they're they're trying. They want me to, to they want to reach out and see if we can get something going with Ancestry. Uh, dot com, some type of uh, endorsement or, or like maybe even uh, uh, like a documentary or something they were talking about. But um, as far as fight wise, we're looking to get back in there soon. I'm, I'm looking at May, June or July. Man, the Ancestry thing is amazing. Ancestry, one of the uh, sponsors of the show, they didn't sponsor this particular episode. I tried to get them on this particular episode when I knew that you'd be joining us, but it's really amazing. Have you talked to anyone from Ancestry to try to do something like this? Because I, I, I have not come across a more famous example of how their company works so well and how it brings families together. You are a walking billboard for them. Have you actually reached out to them yet? No, um, I, I think... Uh, my man, so Malky's probably going to get that ball rolling here this week. Um, I haven't personally reached out. It's just when all this went down, you know, that wasn't on my mind at all. Um, the only thing on my mind when everything happened was to just, uh, you know, connect with my family and, and to foster and start fostering that relationship. And uh, it's like I, I can't explain my gratitude to Ancestry for all this because after the fight, I didn't even go out and celebrate. I stayed up to like me and my, my brother stayed up to like 5 a.m. talking to each other after the fight. Just once again, going over life, talk, just, just catching up. And it's been really awesome because it's like I we both grew up as only child, only children. And now we're kind of getting the, uh, the opportunity to, to connect. I get to be a, a big brother. And don't get me wrong. I've been a big brother since. You know, I was 19 since I met my little brother and sister on my mom's side of the family. But with him being so much closer to me in age and having gone through a lot of the similar, a lot miles, of similar take exit uh, 18 beyond to US life experiences as I have, I it's not that we we or anything. It's just I feel like our bond was almost instant. Wow. Now, are there any other family members who you haven't met who you're looking for? So as far as like immediate family, um, we do have, Legend and I uh, have one other brother on my father's side that we're both a little estranged from. I don't think he's met him either. And so that's kind of like my next goal is to, to uh, figure out how we can, you know, link up the whole family. Um, I kind of realized in these past couple of days as I've been reflecting on everything, like maybe that is my purpose is to bring all these people together. Hmm. Do you think this doesn't happen if you're Continue not a famous straight. UFC fighter? The right lane to take exit 18 beyond to US 441 North. I mean, yeah, without a doubt. Uh, that was one of the first things Legend told me was that it didn't matter that I was a UFC fighter. He like that, and that was one thing he was a little apprehensive about um, in meeting me and everything. It's like he wanted. To make sure that I knew, use the right lane to take exit 18 beyond none of US this, None of North. that mattered to him. That me being a fighter, me being famous, me having these Instagram followers, none of that mattered to him. What mattered was us connecting and having a big brother. Amazing. Now I know you said that you met your your biological father after your UFC debut, but has he ever been to one of your fights? Yes, he was at the. He was at my uh, last two fights. So he was at uh, the fight in Tampa. And he was at this last one. Okay, so so you guys have remained close. You now have a, a real relationship with him. No, without a doubt. Um, I, I we talk periodically. I try. It, that's the thing, you know. The life of a fighter. I'm I'm busy a lot, you know, and it's hard for me because I don't want to sit there and feel like I'm blowing him off. But I do. I do. We have we have maintained a really good relationship, and I've tried my hardest to you know. Uh, communicate with him as much as possible, but it has been um, a really good relationship. Don't get me wrong; I've had, I have uh, an adoptive father, and I do have like the biggest father figure in my life was my mom's second husband, my stepdad, and uh, he raised me. And don't get me wrong; I appreciate everything they've done, but the relationship I've been able to foster and maintain with my biological father. Is, uh, is very special to me. Um, he's, as you know, and I, I mean, there's no other way to put it, you know, as a young half black man, uh, especially growing up in the South, you know, you, you do, you, you go through certain things. And 
to finally be able to 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 talk to someone and be able to relate to someone through that not only just relate to someone but to relate to your own father through that it's um words can't i can't really put into words what it means to have been able to uh to have the relationship that we have i bet yeah i can't imagine and what about with your mom are you guys still close are you talking to her Oh yeah, we're we're super close. I uh, I called her. I called my biological mom as soon as I got back in the locker room after the fight. Um, her like her little kids. They're like I, I don't even know, I can't put into words how much I love those guys. Like I remember when I was nineteen and I first met them. Um, I flew in. To, it was funny. I flew into Norfolk to to meet my mom for the very first time at nineteen, wow. and my little sister was five at the time. And she came up without, this is like literally the first time she's meeting me. She sees me and comes running and jumps in my arms. And like, as soon as she saw me, she like loved me like a brother instantly. And I, I, ever since then, I've been, that's my little sister. You know what I mean? I'd kill for, I'd kill anyone for her. Wow. And, and you took a tour of a, of a, what was it? The, uh, the ships over there. Where, where, Where did you go? Where they, they gave you the flag. What did you do there in, in Virginia? We went to Jeb Little Creek. It's their um, aquatic training center, and they use their. Uh, we got to tour their gunship and the Navy SEAL uh, training facility. Actually, wow! And and why you like? How did this happen? You just you just went and did it, or did they ask you to do it? So my dad is the captain of the USS Gonzalez there in Norfolk. Oh wow! And um, my dad had reached out and asked to see if, like, they if we could do like a meet and greet um, with them. And then when uh, when he did that, the UFC PR team kind of put together a whole little uh, day for me and Joe Benavides to go out there and kind of tour the facilities and meet some of the crew members and uh, just have a really special day. It was and it was super special to me. You know, being the the son of service members of Navy officers, even on my adopted side, and to receive that flag, I I legitimately I, I it was spe- like I was speechless. I I almost burst into tears right there, but I, I couldn't. You know, on uh on uh being filmed by the UFC and yeah. in front of all these military dudes, I had to hold it in. You know. I bet. Yeah, that's amazing. What a week for you, man. Uh, congratulations on the victory. Congratulations on everything that's happening in your life. It seems like it's all coming together. I know you said uh, in conclusion that you want to return May, June, July. Anyone in particular that comes to mind? Man, there are not too many guys out there that I can think of. There's just the, the 155 division so deep in the UFC. There's so many guys, and I'm sure, you know, everybody and their mom kind of wants to get after me and show me that I'm, and you know, kind of prove that, that I'm just some hype train. So, Whoever wants it, man, free smoke. I don't care. All right, let's go. Well done, Luis Pena. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Violent Bob Ross, one of the great nicknames in the history of this sport. Another great moment for you on Saturday. Thanks for coming on. Enjoy the victory, my man. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks for having me on. All right, there he is, Luis Pena. Big week for him, meeting his biological brother. He's talked about this journey uh, several times on the program. And again, Ancestry DNA, uh, one of the sponsors of this program. And, uh, man, they should reach out to him. He should be doing those those commercial reads, right? He should be reading that stuff. Not me. He's a, a, a walking billboard for them. He's living proof that it works. All you have to do, you spit in the little tube, you send it off, and then voila, you can learn so much about your life and your, your family's history. It's an amazing product. So Ancestry DNA, check them out if you've never checked them out before. All right. Uh, in a matter of seconds, we are going to be joined by the reigning, defending UFC middleweight champion, the man who defends his title. I say, technically, for the first time on Saturday, he would say for the second time because he said that he defended his interim title back at UFC 243 and uh, claims that you know he won the real belt when he beat Kelvin Gastelum. So I guess the, the record books would say this is the first time, but he would say second time, and I'm not going to argue with him. How about that? And so it goes down this Saturday against Yoel Romero, the Soldier of God, 
Earlier in the program, we spoke to Yoel. Now we're going to speak to Izzy. Before we speak to Izzy, here's a quick recap about what this man has done over the past 12 or so months. Turn me up. We putting it down. I don't know if I have to tell myself that, but I still think they think I'm all hype. And I'm okay with that. I like hype. I've been about hype. Hype has been a part of my journey. Like, not just through dan um, dancing or fighting, just through life. Silver, I nah, used to craft it for more. Maybe that one was all and not Silver's old. But we did what we did. It was a movie. It was beautiful. It was the passion of the torch. Kelvin was supposed to knock me out. He was supposed to finish me. He hits hard. How's he gonna knock him out? How am I gonna you know, get him? I did what I did. I him up. Robert, I did it in two. And without further ado, we save the best for last. The reigning defending UFC middleweight champion, the last style bender himself, Israel Adesanya. Not Adesanya. Tell him, Izzy. Tell him. All week, I'm going to get crap for saying your name the quote unquote wrong way. Adesanya. I need to hear it from you. Adesanya. Adesanya. Mobolaji Israel Adesanya. You got it. Yes, the man. There he is. Thank you so much for doing this, Izzy. And I was hoping that you'd be in bed shirtless because it kind of is a thing for you now being on the show in bed shirtless. I mean, that's <laughs> okay. Stop it now. I mean, really? <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> Uh, hey, it's, a little, it's a little tease, a little tease. Yes, uh, that was good. That was good. Izzy, thank you so much. By the way, when did you get to uh, Las Vegas? I got to Vegas yesterday, and my body's already used to the beautiful Vegas time zone, the beautiful Vegas weather. It's a little chilly right now, but, yeah, my body is already used to it. It's acclimated because I've been here so many times. Like, for example, if I fought in New York again, I have to go maybe two and a half weeks in advance just because, yeah, my body's not used to that yet. Okay, because can I be honest? I was a little concerned when, when Ash told me that you were only arriving on Sunday because of the time difference. Don't you have to, like, be there one day for every hour of the time difference? Isn't that the rule? I don't know, man. I just follow my own rules. Okay, so you're okay with this? You don't feel like it's, it's too soon? Nah, I feel great. I feel gravy. All right, all right. Um, and, of course, this is a big deal. And, and just so I get it right, you're not defending the title for the first time. This is actually the second time, according to you, correct? If you look on my belt, if you look on my belt, it's got one ruby that says April, I think, 11th, um, Atlanta. And then the next ruby is October 3rd, I think, in Melbourne. So one's for win. It's the exact same fucking belt I got when I won my interim <laughs> title. It's the exact same belt. <laughs> I thought they were going to give me a new belt. That's the undisputed title. But no, they just put a ruby on it. So, I mean, think about it logically. Then... Interim titles don't mean shit if that's the rule, you know? So, there's, I mean, I was the one who was actually running the division while the former champ was, you know, um, sick and couldn't show up to work, you know? I, I was there. I was doing the fucking work. I told you guys I was champion. So I won the belt, and, then I, and it felt like I won the belt. And then you could see that fight back and forth. And I, I raised my hand afterwards like, yes, I won the belt. And Melbourne was more like, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> the knockout power, whatever, right, right, right. And that, I was waiting for something to be different. Like, uh, it didn't feel like Atlanta. Atlanta felt like I won the belt. Melbourne, I defended the belt. All right. That's good enough for me. Um, of course, I have to ask you about this off the top. I have to congratulate you. I have to say Mazel Tov to you, Izzy Lachaim and Mazel, Mazel Tov. Because, Lachaim. yes, my man, you won the Hallberg Award for the Sportsman of the Year in New Zealand. I understand this is a very, very big deal. You're the first ever combat sports athlete to ever win the Sportsman of the Year Award. For those that don't understand how big of a deal this is back home, and congratulations on not only the award, but the speech as well was tremendous and, and, and very profound. How big of a deal was this for you? And were you shocked that you won this award? Um, For me, I wasn't really worried about me. I was thinking more. Dan made it perfectly clear in a tweet. He said, how can you appreciate the meal without thanking the chef? And I thought, I felt Eugene would have won coach of the year because of all the things he's done in our sport, especially just bringing a lot of attention globally to New Zealand. And we have a lot of global people coming over now just to train at our gym. So I thought he would have won. I didn't really care about me because I didn't, I mean, it's hard to get up for a race you never signed up for. But, um... <laughs> Yeah, I just, I mean, it was a big deal, though, because after that and in the speech, I was like a vessel. 
you know, the speech, I don't know, I was just being honest, I was just being real, and people resonated with it, some didn't, but like I said, stay salty, bae, hmm. I don't really care, um, but yeah, uh, it's a big deal, and my, my stock has definitely gone up a lot in New Zealand, and, you know, I'm kind of shaking the, shaking the room a little bit, because of all these Puritans and all these uh, traditionalists who want to... Oh, you know, just, it's, there's still some people are still stuck in the 1996 mindset. And it's like, you can't really stop us, whether you like it or not. Like, look what we're doing for the sport. Look what we're doing for the country. Look what we did in UFC Auckland. And, you know, the, the Puritans are still going to pure Puritan and do whatever they do. Sip tea and comforts and shit. Uh, you talked about tall poppy syndrome in that speech, and it actually reminds me a lot of what Connor went through when he became a star in Ireland. There were a lot of media members talking about what is this barbaric stuff, and he tried to break those barriers and did break those barriers. And so, since the last time we spoke, like since you won the belt, and 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 life has now you know kind of settled in for you as the man, as the champion, you're defending the title in Las Vegas. Do you feel like you're getting more love, or you're getting people who are kind of wishing for you to stumble, hoping for your demise? I get both. Well, I, I definitely feel the love. I feel the love a lot. Like, already I, I get stopped and, like, two to that different places. But, I mean, fuck, I have to move now. I have to move because I, I can't deal with, like, people knowing where I live anymore. So wow. My house is too, yeah, it's too close. Because, I mean, it was good. It was my first house. It was good when it was my first UFC fight. You know, but my, my career shot up so fast. And now it's like, okay, I need the nearest neighbor to be, like, a kilometer down the road. And all 360 degrees, you know. But um, yeah, I'm on the way there, and yeah, the popularity is just part of it, man. This is the things I've 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 um signed up for. Tim, Tim from Paradigm told me, he's, someone told him one time, like, if the worst thing in the world that happens to you that day is someone asking for a photo, and it happens over and over, well, thank God. So I kind of have to remind myself of that because it does get taxing, and it you know I I can't keep the Hey, what's up? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's take it. Like, you know, I, sometimes I'm just chilling like I am right now, and I don't want to, like, fucking ham it up for you. You know, like, if you don't ham it up for the fans, oh, he was a dick, or he wasn't even happy to see us. I was like, I'm not as excited to see you as you are to see me sometimes, <laughs> and that's okay. I'm human, too. <laughs> I might be having a bad day. Fuck. Like, the worst one was the, oh, fuck, shout out to Cinderu. Love you. My cat got run over on the, What? On the anniversary, yeah, on the anniversary of my UFC debut. Oh. And I was just a wreck that day. But then some people, like, some guy came up at the gas station with a phone. He was on the phone. He wanted me to say hi to his brother. And I'm just like, bro, my cat just died today. I'm on the mood. And he kind of like, oh. I was like, hey, bro, what's up? And I was like, wait, what the fuck? Dude, don't fucking put your phone. I'm pumping my fucking car. It stays right there. There's a sign, a phone and a cancellation. No phones near the gas pump. And people don't give a fuck. They want to die for a fucking photo. They want to die for the gram. You know, so, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I just have to say what Tim told me, you know. If that's the worst thing that happens to me today, well, thank God. Thank God the fucking thing didn't spark up to light the guy on fire. But, yeah. yeah. Shit's crazy out here, man. Shit's crazy in the streets, Ariel. Yeah, I know. I feel, and, and, by the way, I'm really sorry about your cat. That's horrible. Yeah, it is. It man. was. I'll, I'll process it afterwards. I'll process everything that's. Yeah, man, this has been a fun camp. This has been a fun camp. Like, ups and downs, smiles and frowns, but everything that's happened has just, like, synchronized itself to this to this climax this weekend. I can't wait, man. Uh, I know that you uh, you keep your ears uh, to the streets, right? You you have your finger on the pulse. You know everything that they talk about online. And you know what the number one question I got when I told the world that you're going to be on the show today? What's on my arm? Yes. You see, I, you're, you, you're, the, you're the freaking best, man. You're the freaking best. You better ask him. What? You mean that? Yes. What is that? Who knows, man? Ah, fuck, man. Hey, you can only cash AIDS once, right? <laughs> Stop. <I joke. laughs> oh, fuck. That's funny. No, um, it was just a little something, a little scrape of myself, and that shit happens, you know? But, ah, whatever. Okay. Oh, well, I'll rub it on his face when it's time. I'll rub it on his face. I mean, is the fight in jeopardy? Fuck no. <laughs> I'm here, right? Okay, I don't I'm know. Get paid. I'm, I'm here, man. I'm here. No, what is it? I'm going to go ahead. Ah, a little stuff. No, I've never had staff in... Wait. Knock on wood. More yep. wood. I never <laughs> will. I mean, fucking hell. I've had malaria damn near eight times. I don't know what else I've had. Like, you think staff's going to fuck with me? Nigga, please. 
Okay. Ha- has this affected you though? Like, I mean, did you need to take time off hospital? I didn't even take antibiotics. I just oh, said, geez. no, I, I looked at it and I was like, no. And it went away. I okay. did it with this one as well. When I was jet skiing, where is it? Oh, you can't see it in this light. I had one on my, on my, on my, um, on my, what do you call it? My, my thumb knuckle when I was jet skiing, you know, a throttle after a while, it starts to like bruise from having so much fun. That one got a little, a little uh, culture developing inside it. But then I just said no. And then it went away. Jeez. That's incredible. Mm. So if you're ever hurt, just say no and it'll all go away apparently. So there's no concern though. Eugene told me, say no. Whenever I used to like, oh, I'm sick. I was like, when I get sick, I just say no. And I just show up. <laughs> I'm going to tell my kids like, that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so no uh, concerns. No, nah, no concerns. I'm going to fight. I'm going to whoop some ass this weekend. Okay. Um, I did hear you say several weeks ago you felt like you were a little bit behind when camp started, but then I heard you say later on you felt like you were a little bit too ahead and you had to dial back in the last few days. So what happened there, and where are you at right now? How are you feeling? Hey, man, my body moves in mysterious ways, <laughs> you know. Um, that's what I've been told. Uh, but, yeah, we're good. We're exactly where we need to be, exactly where we need to be. Like, I just saw Frankie this morning as well. He's right next door with my other wrestling coach, my main wrestling coach, Andre. And we just, yeah, I, sometimes I hugged him. I, I lateral drop tripped him and caught him before he hit the ground. And I let him know I'm ready. That was my hello to him this morning. That guy right there, Frank, I lateral drop tripped him and let him know I'm ready. Like, just, just you know, I feel on, man. I'm on. So I kind of have to dial it back a little bit more just because I want to peak right when it's time. And I'm peaking perfectly, man. Uh, you obviously made... Uh, massive headlines, so much buzz was created because of the walkout prior to 243. You can't just have a normal walkout now, right? You got to do something to top that, correct? Yeah, I what do can. You, why? I mean, yeah, no. I can. <laughs> it, it was too great. Look at the impact that it had for you and your hey, career. My norm- I know. My normal walkouts are crazy as well, but fuck. The UFC, man, sometimes I don't want to give away too much. Like, the day before my UFC debut two years ago, so that was February 11th, February 10th, 2020 i had another metamorphosis some shit changed like another one i know exactly what this is i've talked about it before when i was 27 or 28 on my birthday and again on a significant day of my life i had another one another metamorphosis that synchronized everything and that was your yeah, fuck like my cat died really taught me like you know if you always just your cat whatever but like it taught me life is short because you know you have to make things happen now so i was gonna do that i don't know sometimes put it this way the UFC can shoot themselves on their old foot. That's the staff when they went, when, because you know, they said no to my walkout um, initially, right? Yes. And I'm just like, fucking just trust me. This is my fucking show, 50,000 plus in my backyard or close to my backyard. Like, I'm going to do it my way or no way. So they just need to, like, listen and just trust me. I know what I'm doing with this shit. So, what does that mean for Saturday and the walkout? Are they giving you trouble? You'll see. Ah, uh, you'll see. I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. I said too much. Okay. Well, but you you are thinking of something. There is something going out of your way to see on Saturday. You're a showman. I wasn't gonna do anything. I know. I am. I'm a show off. I mean, I wasn't gonna do anything, but the 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 universe spoke to me that night. That oh. night on February 10th. So something might happen. Something might not. Depending, because hey, I could only do so much. I'm just. I'm just another fighter, just another champion, oh. just another superstar in the UFC. So, I mean, I can only do so much, but we'll see. I was going to do a normal walk, like walk out like before. You're getting fucking all the exclusives. You're good. It's because I'm in bed. You fucking sweet talk me, and then I give you all the secrets. Is this how you work? Look at him. Look at that smirk. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, along, along those lines, uh, Izzy, uh, I asked you last time you were on in uh, January, were they treating you well? Did they give you a good deal? You said there were some things. So are they treating you well? What happened? Yeah. Trust me, I don't fight unless I get, I, don't, I don't come to bed unless I, I get treated right. So I'm here. It's UFC 248. I'm getting treated well. Okay. So, I mean, I have, if you see my nigga, hold up, let me show you this. Oh. This is my shower right now. This is, you know, like my infamous after, after fight shower. Yes. I get to like, fucking look at that. Look at this. So much room for activities. <laughs> I can just walk in here. Just relax if I want to. Fuck. This is, this is how you get it right. Shit, man. Like, they treated me right. I made sure I let them know. Like, Melbourne, the suite in there, Melbourne was shit. It was like a fucking three-star hotel. So, you know, my people, Ash, Tim, Audie, 
they make sure we go right for this one. Okay. I'm happy to hear that. Any concerns about UL's weight? We had him on earlier. He said 198. Uh, 198. I don't know what that is. Uh, 98. <laughs> that's like 90-something kgs. Uh, is it 90-something? I don't know. I don't care. For me, I, I forgot the rules have changed. I thought we were still – I kind of just used the um, Travis Luter, Anderson Silva – thing where it wasn't considered a title defense now the rules have changed so i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do i'm gonna still became champion or remain champion but if he doesn't make weight then fuck that's on him i just get a, a large chunk of his check i'm sure abe better be getting him that check <laughs> so yeah I'll, I'll make sure i get a, a nice chunk of that a big slice but you're lion share if you will you're not gonna put your foot down and say if he doesn't make 185 this fight is off type of thing Nah, fuck no, I want to fight. I want to fight. It's still on. I just, I forgot that rule was in place. So that's why I was like, well, we might need a replacement. If, cause I, 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 I want this to be a title defense on my part. Mm-hmm. So I, as long as that happens, I don't care. Cause I'm not going through, you know, a guy like him, a head like him, and then have that just be like, oh, just another fight. Like, fuck that. I'm not, <laughs> I'm playing for keeps, son. This is for legacy. So I need that head on my mantelpiece. In Houston, is it possible that he went up to you? In the uh, the dance off department, the backflip, the splits, all that. Did he get the best yeah. of you there? I mean, you know, he stole the moment. Like I've I've lost many dance battles in my life. Trust me, and I've won many, plenty. But he stole the moment. So in that moment, you can't try and recreate it or like recapture it. Because I mean, it's hard to do a backflip when you have twelve pound gold on your shoulder. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something that he'll never have. <laughs> oh. But yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to, but uh, he stole the moment, so that's a kill off. You just gotta let it go. You just gotta let it go. And I said, he can win a dance battle, I'll win the fucking war. What did you say to him when you guys were squaring off there? I said, I spoke Spanish to him. I said, what's Whoa. up? I can't remember. I spoke Spanish. He said, oh, you speak Spanish. I was like, oh, a little bit. I spoke Spanish back. And he started, all sexy and spicy. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I spoke Yoruba to him. I said, I'm speaking Spanish to you just because you don't understand Yoruba. So I'm going to speak Spanish to you. I said that in Yoruba to him. And then I said, and then he kissed me back. I was like, Mwah. my heart. And I was like, I'll break your heart and your face. I'll break your heart and your face. <sighs> and then, yeah, that was that. And then you had uh, a second press conference. It was shades of the infamous uh, TJ Dillashaw, Hen and Burrell face-off where Burrell, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've seen this because you, you've seen everything online where Burrell's on screen and Dillashaw squaring off one of the more bizarre face-offs this time he was like above you and uh, you're sitting there yeah. and and of course uh you you made the the 9-11 reference which you've since apologized for do you regret saying that and and did you take anything away from that like about maybe trying to slow down when you not get too excited when you're up there on stage talking making references and whatnot no nah, not really like I, I I said what I said but then after as soon as I left my, I kind of saved it in the room I saved it with like a what too soon, and then I kind of eased the tension a little bit. But then obviously there's the the real outrage, and then there's gonna be the fake outrage that just all like you know fucking the juice monkey in Brazil. You know he I bet you he doesn't even know where he was when 9/11 happened. I know where I was. I remember how I felt. But I bet you he doesn't even know. He's just oh do 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 do. I never made fun of anyone. I never made a joke. I just made a reference to something that actually happened. But I was like you know what that might still be triggering for some people. So I was like yeah. That was my bet on that one. But I don't think I need to slow down on anything. I just, I operate at the speed. This is the speed I operate at. And eventually I'll say something stupid again. I don't know. This is just, it's, it's, it's a numbers game. It's probabilities. I'm bound to fuck up at some point. So I don't, I don't like, oh no, I got to slow down and change my tactics. No, I just, I'll be careful with my words, but I'm going to operate at the same speed and I'm going to fuck up again. So get ready for your fake outrage and the real ones. How do you feel about Costa flying to the event and being there on Saturday? Ringside, he said he's going to do this. Fuck, he already did it in Melbourne, didn't he? We already had that whole thing after the fight. It's 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 over now. He needs to fucking do something else to get up for this to, to get up for the spot. I don't know. I'll see what the landscape of the middleweight division is because he's still on my fucking list. I'm gonna pop him before Usada does. Guarantee that. But he's still on my list, and for me. We'll see. I don't really, I didn't even know. I just, this is breaking news to me. So I don't know. Uh, we'll see who else is at the event. We'll see who else is there. Mm. I wonder if John Jones is going to be there. You think he'll show up? Don't care. Don't care. Mm, no, I mean, what's he going to do? He fucking damn near lost his last fight on some scorecards, you know? So 
Uh, something I've been saying for so long. I said I saw him in New York. It was in New York? No, it was Las Vegas. It wouldn't fought um Santos. I saw what I needed to see live, and I was like, ah, he's not it. Everyone, like, and then after the last fight, they're like, oh shit, maybe Izzy was right. I've seen the fucking thing. I fucking know what to do. Let me just work. Let me work. Please let me work. Okay, I'm sorry. But did you think Reyes won that fight? <laughs> yeah, I could give it to Reyes, but it depends on how you want to score it. You know, I think Jones as well could have stolen it. But this is me being objective. Glad I'm not a fucking judge. Mm. Trust me, I'm glad I'm not a judge. But it was either way, either way. Trust me. Like Reyes definitely put it on him, and Jones came in, in the later rounds and and put it on. But hey. No one puts it on in the later runs like again. I can do it all night long, man. Look at the Tavares fight. I was having fun in that fight. Look at the Gaston fight. I wasn't having fun, but I fucking dug deep and I I blitz him. I blitz a guy that wouldn't go down, and I made him go down over and over and over again. Play, huh? Yes. Uh, I I don't know if you know this, but I I sat down with John recently in Albuquerque. And uh, he didn't really like it when I brought you up. Could I play you a clip of, of him yeah, answering my question and get your response? Roll the clip. All right, here it is. Roll, Roll the, clip. the clip. I don't think a, a long, lean middleweight um, would, would uh, present me much problem, especially once I got my hands on him and put him to the ground. Mm. Yeah. People, people are, can eat up what he's saying. But the truth of the matter is he's scared today. I am so far ahead when it comes to, I mean, you name it. In every sense of this game, I'm so far ahead of this kid. So the fact that I'm even talking about him right now, I'm just going to stop. Your response? I think I already responded to that. I can't remember if it was you. But it's the same shit. Like, do I look scared? Ariel, am I a man of fear? You, you've met me. Do I look like a man... I mean, this is I'm I'm in a fight right now that I shouldn't have to be in. I sh- and a, a lot of managers would be like, "Nah, don't fight that guy. Let's let's wait it out. Let's do something else." Fear does not bother me. It's something that I rise to the occasion. And he's just jealous. Come on, I've been saying this. The man is jealous. He's gonna see what I do this weekend when the stocks shoot up. It's gonna be like, "Fuck, I sucked in my last fight, and this guy just did this, and his stock's just rising." He's gonna get jealous again. He's gonna get salty and. Come on, man. I mean, uh, what else am I going to say? I, I, I set the date. I told you what's going to happen. I'm going at my own pace. They're not going to make me move my hand first. So, yeah, I've said what I said, and there's nothing more to add to it. If you say something stupid, I'll rebuttal, but I never really talk about him unless I'm asked about him. Mm-hmm. You ask me about him, so I'm talking about him. Uh, your coach Eugene doesn't say a lot, but he does bring up Stipe a lot. He does talk about, yeah, we don't really want the Jones fight with Stipe, which is, uh, you know, obviously an even bigger jump. How do you feel about this idea? I think he brought it up in submission radio when we're doing the interview side by side for us, and I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> don't get me wrong. Like, I love the idea, but like at first I was like, at least run it by me first. But I like the fact that he just brought it up live. I was like, okay. And I thought about it. I was like, I never even put my myself in that bracket yet. So I haven't really thought about it much. But look, people that look after me, I trust them with my life. I trust them with my health. I trust them with my record. I trust them with my, my career. He sees the benefits that we can, we can reap in that fight. He sees the advantages we can take in that fight. And guess what? I've done it in boxing. I fought a heavyweight. I've done it in kickboxing. I fought a heavyweight. And I train with heavyweights as well. You know, there's things we can do. There's things that you guys haven't even seen in my game yet. You guys haven't even seen in my game yet. So, yeah, in time, you've seen snippets of my grappling. You've seen snippets of my wrestling. Maybe, I don't know, have you? I don't know, maybe. But in time, you guys will find out, like, there's a lot of things that can be taken advantage in this fight game. Size matters, but not always. Mm. Just a couple of minutes left here with Izzy. And again, thank you so much for the time. He returns to action on Saturday, UFC 248. I love this budding friendship that you have with Darren Till. You guys sending each other DMs and whatnot. How did this come about? I met him in LA for the first time. And, you know, you know me. I'm a man of my... I, I don't mince words. I was like, I can't wait till we fight. Like, I like his style. He's like, yeah, me too. I can wait. I can... I was like, okay. <laughs> and... Yeah, you know, he's he says he's ape, but Koba's not ape. And when it's time, I'll show him who Caesar is. Oh my. Okay, so he is on the hit list as well, despite the the 
the friendly banter. Yeah, I mean, I fight my friends. You used to see me and Dan go at it in sparring sometimes. You see me and Brad go at it in sparring sometimes. Like, we're not like these guys in Holland who fucking try and kill each other just for killing each other's sake, but we can turn it up specifically to certain parts of the body and to certain degrees when it's time, and it gets pretty heated. But afterwards, we high-five it like, that was good. You know, like, we're trying to better each other. So I fought my blood brother, you know? I said it in before, I fought my grandma, but she's dead. Well, yes. you know, things happen. Eventually, some of these guys are going to have to get hit, whether you're, I don't know, buddy or enemy or there's beef or no beef or vegan or whatever. At the end of the day, everyone's going to get it. Everyone's going to get it, including old Darren Till or even Jared Cannonier. I like the guy. I like everyone. You know, I'm the guy now with the belt. I'm the guy everyone wants to target. So I know. A lot of people smile on my face and they yeah, buddy, buddy, but I know they want what I have. So I'm not stupid. I've been here before. I've seen this shit happen before. I've been betrayed many times. So I know, uh, yeah, buddy, buddy, cool, cool, cool. And I am friendly with Darren. I'm friendly with a lot of these guys, but I make no mistake. I know exactly what they want. I know exactly why they're trying to get close to me, but you got to keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. And to go to that Auckland event and to repeat the three-peat and to see what your, your teammates did you know, two weeks prior to yours, does, does that give you an extra boost? Like, did you feel inspired after that? Like, all right, my guys did this and now it's my turn. The timing seems to have worked out very well for you from afar. You talk about timing and I say synchronicity. Everything is perfect, Ariel. Everything is falling into place exactly as it should. Man, what we're doing right now is going to be legendary. The way our team is rocking right now is going to be written in the history books. It's going to be like some some Trojan shit with the Trojan horse, how we just invaded the game and took it over for years to come. Man, I'm, I'm inspired, man, watching the way even Brad, he was my favorite fight out of all the three. He was my favorite fight because of he just, he owned it. He owned the moment, you know? Shut up, Mike. I'm on <laughs> We didn't hear anything. Oh, it's Timmy! Oh, there he is. Old Tim Simpson. We out here. Hello. <laughs> That's my guy. That's my guy. Hey, brother. Well, I'll finish this first. Yeah, one minute left. You got you. That was it? You didn't want to uh, finish? What was I saying? What you, was I saying? you were saying you uh, were inspired saying? by Brad. Inspired. Fuck yeah. Like, I mean, he's the guy, you know, the guy that, um, you know, no one wants to fight because, he, you know, he, he had a nice comeback in the UFC uh, with, you know, spinning back kick. Uh, He's, you know, Part of the Dagestani crew, a guy that you know, like everyone associates them with Khabib, the dominance of, of and their side of the world, they're fucking motherfuckers, man. But Brad's like, bro, I've been to Thailand for years. I've been training with these guys for years. And I think even Brad said, like, the fight kind of got set up by the Dagestani boys and, and Tiger. They were like, should fight this guy, should fight this guy, like kind of hoping he'd lose. And Brad just owned the moment, man. Brad just rocked him in the first round, rocked him in the second, and just owned the moment in the third. And I was inspired by that. I was really inspired by that. That just, Brad's one of my favorite fighters in the world, bar none, just simply put, just because he's so different from me and he does shit that I can't do sometimes. And it's just beautiful to watch. Last thing, I, I know you said you want to be the first man to finish Yoel in the UFC, but I've also heard you say you want a 5-0 shutout. You, you kind of feel like it's going to go that way. On the Monday before the fight, what are you predicting? Mm, what am I predicting? The Monday before the fight, I'd say I still want that 5 nil shot. That's what I'm ready for, you know? But like I said, people gas. And I know for a fact who's going to get tired first. And I know people are easy to finish when they get tired. You look at Whitaker when he was fighting him. You look at Costa when he was fighting him. Recent fights, they were all just gassed. Everyone just gassing like they fought off a storm. You look at me in the deep waters, man. Call me Megalodon because I'm a fucking shark. I swim with them and I eat them up. So, yeah, I want to fight no shut up. But if they can't swim, if they drown, they drown. If they die, they die. That's it. Izzy, you're the man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Uh, you're please the man. keep that arm okay, healthy. No, say no to it. No, go back inside. And uh, oh my. Okay. Wow. All right. That looks. <laughs> uh, Steven, I love you. Steven Adams says hello as well. Hey, what's up, Steven? That's my guy. I saw that interview. Respect to him. He's the fucking man. He's the man. I don't know why he sees me as an elder. We're not that old. I mean, fucking hell. <laughs> I get what he means. So, 
Respect to him. Shout out to Lisa, the Wolfie. Mwah. See you guys. Respect. Thank you so much, Izzy. Good luck on Saturday. There he is. Israel Adesonia, the reigning defending UFC middleweight champion of the world. Wow. What a performance out of him on this program. He always brings it. Great stuff, as always. Great insight. And he headlines UFC 248 on Saturday. I'm off to Las Vegas on Thursday. What a card. Should I run down some of the notables? We got a second here. Uh, who do we have? Pollyanna Viana on the early prelims at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. We've got Gerald Mershot and Deron Wynn. As we spoke about earlier, Rodolfo Vieira, undefeated, 6-0 on the ESPN prelims beginning at 8 p.m. Mark Madsen, 9-0 against Austin Hubbard. I'm looking forward to that. And we've also got Sugar Sean O'Malley making his long-awaited return. Two years he's been away. He's fighting on the prelims, of course, on the main card, Alex Oliveira against Max Griffin. Li Zhangliang against Neil Magny, Benil Dariush against Drakkar Close, Zhang Wei Li against Yuan Yan Jacek for the strawweight title. 20 and 1, Zhang Wei Li going up against Yuan Yan Jacek and Israel Desanya versus Yo Romero. Now, a little bit of an announcement for all of you. As usual, I'll have my uh, Hawani Show pod on Wednesday, but on Thursday, we're debuting a new thing on ESPN Radio. Thursday night at midnight Eastern, so technically very early uh, Friday morning, but 9 p.m. Pacific time on ESPN Radio, national or online, but wherever you get your radio goodness, Sirius XM, Channel 80, all that stuff. It's the Hawani Show on ESPN Radio, but it's not just the Hawani Show. It's the Hawani and DC Show. Daniel Cormier, my co-host, on Thursday. And how great is it going to be to get his insight, not only on the top two fights, but also his guy, Deron Wynn, and everything going on in his life. So that's this Thursday night, 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio. We have to come up with a catchy name because this might be a thing, my friends. We'll talk more about that later in the week, but I wanted to mention that as well. All right. The music means I'm out of time. What a day it has been. Getting set for UFC 248 back in Las Vegas, Nevada. We were just there a month and a half or so ago for Conor McGregor, and now we return for... The guy who has won seven fights in the UFC quicker than anyone in the modern era. The last style bender. It's always a big deal. It's always a big show. It always feels like it's a little different when these stars come out. And to have him and Zhang Wei Li on the same card, that is fun. I got to say, I'm looking forward to this. And I like the, the names sprinkled throughout as well. So that goes down on Saturday. Stay tuned for that. For now, though, we are out of time. Thank you very much to all of you for tuning in. Thank you very much to Felicia Spencer. Congrats to her. Hopefully she gets that title fight. Thank you very much to Yoel Romero. Good luck to him. Thank you very much to Megan Anderson. Thank you very much to Demetrius Johnson. Thank you to Paul Felder. That was great stuff. Thank you very much to Ron Wynn. Good luck to him. Congrats to Luis Pena on his big week. And thank you very much and good luck to the last style bender, Israel Adesonia himself. If you missed anything, check it out. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the app, Twitter, YouTube, all those places and more. Back next week, same time and place. Until then, I say peace. I'm out of here. And I was hoping that you'd be in bed shirtless because it kind of is a thing for you now being on the show in bed shirtless. I mean, that's okay. Stop it now. I mean, really? <laughs> I mean, really? You're representing the Miami Marlins. It's a great scene. Uh, I have to ask you this because everyone's kind of concerned. Hey, hey. Yes. And and new look at that and I, today i was gonna be good today it was monday i was like oh, i'm gonna get back on the trying to eat mostly healthy i had six filled donuts <sighs> it's a show I, I call it the week of debauchery ariel every oh. time when they give me the hat i win isn't that the rule i don't know man i just follow my own rules damn that was a hard ass shot i am the man you know Tired giant yeah. When he say I want to fight you all, uh, a grilled cheese at like 12 o'clock at night. He want to fight me because I am the man. Because I like Jurassic Park, it's one of my favorite movies. So I thought I'd kind of rock it. I'm rocking like a, a a Lion King one right now. Homemade macaroni and cheese that my mom made for. Oh yes. It's just like what Max Holloway said. It is what it is. <laughs> yes. I, I, I am the freaking man. You know, I am, I am freaking mad, bro. I know. I am freaking mad. But like I said, stay salty, babe. Mm. I don't really care. I'll
Uh, I did also get married uh, to my longtime fiance uh, in December, and so that was, you know, we kind of threw that together quickly since I was like, well, I still don't have flight lined up, and he didn't have flight lined up, so like, let's hurry and just get married. Everybody and their mom kind of wants to get after me and show me that I'm, and, you know, kind of prove that, that I'm just some hype train. Hey, dog, you just whooped my ass on ESPN, bro. Like, <laughs> nah, this ain't, we ain't cool, G. But I also fight for me, and, uh, I like to plan. I'm not as excited to see you as you are to see me sometimes, <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs>